Good evening and welcome to the February 12th, 2015 meeting of the Northampton School Committee. I'm Mayor David Narkowitz and we'll begin the meeting by asking the clerk to call the roll of the school committee. Ms. Laura Fallon. Present. Ms. Pam Hammer. Present. Ms. Ann Percy. Present. Mr. Downey Meyer. Present. Mr. Howard Moore. Here. Mr. Here. Mr. Present. Mayor David Present. Excellent. Thank you very much. Um, we'll begin the meeting uh, with the public comment period. And I have a list of folks who have signed up to speak in public comment. And I would just ask folks when you come up to um, just state your name and address for the record. And I have a three minute timer that we use. And I'll just ask you to please uh, try to limit your remarks to the three minutes. So the first person signed up is Attorney Jim Winston. Hi, uh, good evening, Jim Winston, 144 Franklin Street, Northampton, Mass. And I'm just going to take uh, the three minutes to talk about a, a topic that's been discussed um, many, many times about the start time in Northampton High School. I'm a proud graduate of Northampton High, class of 86. And it, it seems, I think, that most people can agree that the studies that have been done, volumes of studies actually, have all indicated that high school kids in particular need a later start time uh, due to their sleep patterns. And that the studies show that academically, they do better. And in fact, every phase of their life, they do better with, with a later start time and, and ending a little bit later. And, and that has to be the priority, the, the, the academic and the, the overall health and well-being of the children. And, and I know there's extracurricular activities um, that, that also factor into it. I mean, I, I was a proud member of the swim team for four years in high school. But those logistical concerns about practices and extracurricular concerns I, I think can be worked out and, and frankly they're, they're secondary to the overall um, health and academic su success of the high school su uh, students and I would submit that other communities that have a later start time the, the students are, are much much better off and, and I would also submit that 730 is too early for these students and that they would be doing better with, with a later start time and I, and I think that's been proven uh, conclusively. I know there's also logistical issues uh, regarding um, the buses. And I understand, I mean, I also went to JFK here. So I understand that the buses have to serve the other schools. But I, I think that there are, are, there are ways to work out the, the busing schedules and the logistical issues of, of the start times for the other schools in the city that, that, the, that the high school shouldn't have to start earlier due to that. And, and I think there's, um, what's, I think what's so frustrating about this process is it seems that the school committee, and I'm just looking at this from afar, from someone that grew up in Northampton um, and didn't have that quite that early start time when I went to high school in the mid 80s, that this school committee has gotten to the point where they've actually agreed with, with the uh, volumes of studies that have shown the later start time is better and then it seems at the last moment something happens, whether it's a new principal, a new superintendent, something happens and, and we just lose a year. And we say, well, well, we'll put that back. We'll stay with the 7.30 start time. And, and, it, and it seems to, to happen time and time again. So I'm, I'm uh, added, please add my voice to, to um, a growing list of voices that would, would strongly advocate to do whatever we can for a later start time, whether that's a half hour later, whatever is deemed uh, to be appropriate, but I would absolutely urge this committee to, to try to, to push through this time with the later start time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay, the next person signed up is Jeremy Whalen. Hello, everyone. My name is Jeremy Whalen. Uh, I live at 214 Pomeroy Lane in Amherst, uh, but I'm a teacher at uh, Northampton High School in the tech department. Uh, a, a couple of things, I wanted to talk about the robotics club, I got the glasses on my head, I just came from it. But uh, uh, before I got started on that, I just wanted to thank um, one of my students' uh, mothers, Cheryl uh, Sivjan, who donated uh, graciously a couple of SD cards, uh, much needed SD cards to our, our program, uh, and even though it's a little thing, I like to come and you know I'll always come for if anyone donates anything. I'd also like to, to thank NCTV. They're always continuously uh, supporting our students. 
uh, in providing their facilities and education. Uh, they just donated a, an emergency hard drive for a crash of our, one of our server computers in, our, in my room. Uh, and they had it that day. They, uh, we got it installed and we were up and running the next day. So thank you so much to NCTV as well as uh, some of the things that they're doing that are in the works. They're kind of the educational venture capitalists for a nice project that we're doing to make a, um, a virtual Northampton actually out of some, uh, some things that we're doing with the planning office. Uh, and um, James and Wayne Fiden over there, so they've been a terrific, we've had some terrific collaborations, uh, thanks in, in due part to the planning office and uh, to uh, Northampton Community Television. Um, one thing before I talk about uh, robotics too briefly, I would love to uh, uh, talk to the school committee um, and also uh, Candace, uh, to, who's been a great help uh, with uh, donations and everything, to really look at some of the things uh, that are going on with uh, purchases for teachers. One of the things is we have to go through currently uh, purchase orders. Although in lieu of purchase orders, a teacher can front that their own money for things, uh, which do does not require that purchase order. But what happens in that event is, uh, I would have to, I, I could get uh, some refurbished cameras from directly from Canon for about three hundred thirty dollars to four hundred dollars. With the purchase orders, there were about seven hundred to seven hundred fifty. So there's considerable discount, uh, and I think that. With good intention, uh, I think that we would love to, to come up with a, a new system on that. Uh, just to talk about the robotics club, uh, the, um, the uh, Kyle and Jonathan uh, may allude to this, but I just want to, to stress how awesome the collaboration has been with Smith's Vocational and uh, everybody on board. Uh, we just moved our facilities over to Smith Vocational, so we're, we're meeting there. We meet six days a week. Uh, and we're also provided the resources on equipment and software from Smith Vocational too. So uh, Andy, uh, Dr. Lincoln Hoker, Andy Lincoln Hoker, the principal, is one of the mentors actually too. So he's been a great resource. Uh, he's, been at, he's been a familiar face at the meetings. Um, and there's really good positive collaboration uh, going on with Smith Vocational. Uh, and aside from that, I'm running out of time. Thank you and yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much. The next person to speak is Steve Harrell. Good evening, everyone. My name is Steve Harrell, and I live at 474 Elm Street, just about a block from Northampton High School. In the ongoing effort to provide a healthy start time for that very school, Tonight you will learn the actual bus ridership figures. Without yet seeing the data, I estimate that the extra cost to the budget will be about fifty to seventy thousand dollars to provide for a change in the start time, maybe less. <clears throat> I do know that due to the override in our mayor's wise three-year stabilization plan that the schools shouldn't be in a state of poverty next year. Besides that, many studies have shown that a monetary increase to accommodate a later start time is money well spent and very cost effective. For example, the statement last August from the American Academy of Pediatrics referenced one study which showed that, quote, moving school start time later by one hour can have an impact on standardized test scores comparable to decreasing the class size by one third. So later start times are equal to smaller classes. This makes sense. What's better, a small class where 53% of students are falling asleep or a little larger class of awake, alert learners? And from a study published by the Brookings Institute in 2011 on this subject, they said, quote, starting class later can be an inexpensive way to boost achievement. We argue that investing the resources to alter busing schedules can be a worthwhile investment. Yet another study of Wake County, North Carolina, a large county with 23 high schools, showed that adjusting start times and bus schedules would cost about $150 per student per year, whereas a considerable reduction in class size, adding teachers, would cost about $2,100 per student. They concluded, quote, Increased spending on bus transportation in order to delay the beginning of the school day may be substantially cheaper than reducing class sizes to gain the, to gain the same improvement in test scores, end quote. <coughs> in Fairfax County, Virginia, to provide 
to provide for their later start times voted in for this fall, the county is increasing their bus schedule by $5 million. Now with 25 high schools, this, is a, this works out to $200,000 extra for each high school. So for us, an extra fifty dollars to $70,000 is a bargain. In conclusion, remember, better sleep is not a frivolous extra perk, not just an okay option if we have the money. It is fundamental and far-reaching. I won't bore you with amazing quotes from important persons. You've heard them all before. Let's just get this done now for our sons and daughters. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, um, that's the list that was signed up. Is there anyone else who wishes to speak in public comment? Okay, seeing none, we'll move on to any announcements from members of the school committee. Okay, so uh, no announcements. We'll now move into the uh, recommended actions. And this evening we have a consent agenda before you that includes the approval of minutes of the school committee meeting revised for December 11th, 2014, the school committee meeting of January 8th, 2014, the negotiating subcommittee meeting of January 22nd, 2015, the special school committee meeting of January 29th, 2015, and the budget and property subcommittee meeting of February 5th, 2015. We have no contracts before you this evening, and we have several field trip requests. We have JFK Wright Flight Program, New England Air Museum, going to Windsor Locks, Connecticut on March 4, 2015. The robotics team attending the New England District Robotics Competition in Hartford, Connecticut, March 27 through the 29th, 2015. The NHS Boys Indoor Track Team traveling to the New Balance Indoor Nationals in New York City, March 13 through the 14th of 2015. Eighth grade Latin students going to the Metropolitan Museum of Art and Central Park Zoo, New York City, April 2nd, 2015. And eighth grade Spanish students going to the Spanish Theater Repertory Company and Central Park Zoo, New York City, April 2nd, 2015. I would request a motion to approve the consent agenda. Move to approve the consent agenda as presented. Second. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the consent agenda is adopted. We'll now move to uh, reports and recommendations and we'll turn to our student representatives, Kyle O'Connell and Jonathan Latender. Thank you, Mayor. Um, <clears throat> February vacation is coming up soon. Starts February 16th and ends the 20th. Eighth grade parents night uh, for incoming ninth graders is February 26th. The senior class is hosting a dance for JFK students. This will take place on Friday, February 27th. The Vin Dog Show will be held on Saturday, March 7th. The money that they make from this event will go to Northampton High School. Progress reports will be handed out by March 13th. The annual musical is Godspell this year and is being held the weekend of March 12th. The NHS Improv Troupe is going to be performing on Friday, March 20th in the auditorium. Applica uh, the National Honor Society is beginning to accept applications for qualifying juniors who have a 3.4 GPA or higher. Northampton High School had several award winners who competed in the scholastic art and winning contest. Eight students won awards from honorable mention to gold key for writing, and three students earned awards from honorable mention to silver medal for art. Due to the mountains of snow, we have already have had five snow days this year, and Currently, the last day of school is June 24th. The Anti-Social Media Challenge was held on January 8th, and it was a great success. A lot of students, including myself, participated in it. As we continue to make our school a safer and more secure environment for students and staff, they will be tightening up the school procedures. So effective immediately, flowers, balloons, gifts, cards, etc., will not be accepted at the main office for security reasons. and you won't really be able to go and get called out of class to meet with your parent either unless it is an exceptional request which has to be deemed approved by the administration. Applications to help with the JFK mural project are being accepted through this Friday. The positions available are teaching assistants and painting and design assistants. 
the job will pay a stipend of $150. The following students recently had their artwork recognized through the art competition. The seniors recognized were Anya Spector, who received a silver medal, and Jake Bridgman, who received an honorable mention. Sophomore Sabrina Hahn also received an honorable mention. And congratulations to the following Honors Art 4 students whose art was chosen to represent NHS at the second annual Emerging Young Artists Invitational Exhibit, which was held at UMass Dartmouth. They were Anya Spector, Cassie Bills, Christina Strauss-Kennedy, Emlyn Homestead, and Maddie Gibson. And Team 4097's 2015 build season is drawing to a close. Despite challenges, they have almost completed a relatively well-functioning robot. Mm. This year, uh, they physically transitioned their build area over to Smith Vocational High School, as Jeremy talked about, to incorporate their students to get their technological experience. Our, uh, their competitions are rapidly approaching, one of which will be very local, and invite, they invite everybody to join them in cheering on the robot. Those events coming up are in Springfield at the Mass Mutual Center Friday and Saturday, March 6th and 7th and in Hartford, Connecticut at the Hartford Public High School Saturday and Sunday, March 20th and 29th. Okay. Thank you very much for that report. We'll now move into the, uh, the uh, first item of, um, of voting business this evening. We have a presentation uh, regarding a gift to the Jacks from the Jackson Street PTO for playground funds, and I believe we have Principal Agna and uh, Joe Comerford here this evening. Hello. Good evening. So, uh, shall I? Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, so, on behalf of the Jackson Street School uh, PTO and the families on the playground committee, and of course the faculty and staff yes. members who have worked really hard alongside us, we're here to say that very happily that we have be enabled to date to secure upwards of $241,000 for an expansion of the beloved Miss Agna Playground. Um, as I know you've heard a lot about at Jackson Street, we had to let go of our wooden structure, which had served the community very well, um, but was, had become increasingly a health hazard, a safety risk for our students and families and community members. Um, and so it was a very collaborative, incredibly student invested, family invested process, faculty invested process at Jackson Street. Um, and we built a budget uh, where we sought federal funds from the Community Development Block Grant and very uh, great thanks to CDBG folks, Peg Keller, and of course the Mayor's Office for their support. Um, also we approached the CPA, the Community um, Preservation Act for uh, state monies, and again thank you so much to the CPA. <coughs> and our families have held tireless fundraisers, <laughs> hoopathons, um, bake sales, uh, community, big community projects. People have held uh, garage sales where they've sold things for the playground. And of course we did a, a very big push at Valley Gives, which is the community foundation. And really a terrific, um, a terrific venture there. Uh, so uh, we've brought in 176,000 from CPA, 30,000 from CDBG, and 40,000, 41,000 from individuals. We haven't yet approached businesses, that's next. Um, uh, but right now we're coming to you to ask that you accept these three pockets of money uh, so that we can go to bid um, for this uh, playground expansion. I'd just like to add that um, we have mourned the loss of our big wooden structure, which was iconic and something that I, as a parent, had been a part of building 24 years ago. The exciting part, though, after we've mourned, is that we are really developing something that is state-of-the-art, including fully handicap accessible, which is something that we haven't had. In and I think there aren't many of those sorts of playgrounds in Northampton. So we're, we're excited about that, and we're excited about the fact that there is so much investment in it in our community. And it will expand one of the, the playgrounds that we have left. and. Uh, we aren't expecting to have more playgrounds than that, but we would like to have a <laughs> playground that can accommodate uh, two grades of our students, about 120 or 30 kids at a time, which right now it's very difficult since it's a smaller playground. So we're, I'm just so proud to be a part of this incredible group of families and kids who are, are very invested in it too. So I really thank Joe and all of the parents. They've really been the ones to do this. 
Uh, Ms. Duvall? Um, my kids love playing on the wooden structure for years and years and years. Is it going to be open for the public to come in? Is it going to be just as enticing for the community, or is it going to be more? Uh, no, no, no. We did this with the community in mind. Okay. Um, we, we were very invested in uh, talking with neighbors, different mm -hmm. pockets of community stakeholders. We did a very big, inclusive, fairly long uh, process of getting feedback. You know, what's important to you? What was important to you about the wooden structure? What's going to be important to you now? Um, that we expand um, the Miss Agna playground. We actually were sad that we, because of um, very swampy lands, we couldn't put the playground in the front of the school again. Part of the wooden structure's demise was the river that runs through that piece <laughs> of Jackson Street's property. And so we couldn't do that again. Um, but we are going to do a big um, christening, if you will, uh, when the playground is launched in the fall, which is our hope, where we invite the entire community to come play at Jackson Street. And so one of the things that Gwen's done so beautifully at Jackson Street is that we don't think of that, the families there don't think of it as our school, we think of it as the community school. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say I'm really impressed at your fundraising on Valley Gives that day. I, I was keeping an eye on it and um, Jackson Street was just right there and I love I mean, the fact that you already have such a strong community and that you reach out and, and, and are inclusive to the rest of the community. But congratulations on what you did on Valley Gives. That was awesome. It's a great effort. And I'm looking forward to taking my daughter on the playground. And she did ask me, why is it behind? Why isn't it out there anymore? And asked if she could still play on it. And that was why. It's a great question. Mm -hmm. We have to no. make that, we have to clear that. That's a great question. It actually inspires yeah. us to make it clearer. Mm -hmm. We had some um, mm -hmm. low funded, if you will, mm -hmm. signs that said, hey, come and play around back. Mm -hmm. um, that were out at Jackson Street for a while when we took down the wooden structure and we did some media around it with the Gazette, but we, we could do a better yeah. job yeah. at that. Maybe we'll have it in the front of the school mm -hmm. or something. Sometimes it just takes a kid's question, to, you know. So yeah, they're the most important questions, right? Yeah, and I think the word on the street will get out as once it's built that that's where you go instead of what's accessible mm -hmm. from the street or visible from the street, that is. Well, thank you. I think my daughter will also find it quite interesting about the river and how, how um, I mean, especially being 12 and still likes the playgrounds, but just the learning and aspect of all of that, too, really ties in well. Thank you. And the, the river that runs through it, we actually are going to be trying to harness a little bit of that <laughs> as part of our outdoor science playground, which we've also been developing. Through, Superintendent, um, that's a question. A lot of parent involvement as well. That's awesome. Thank you very much. I want to recognize the superintendent. For I just wanted to make a few quick comments. First of all, I wanted to thank you for all of your work on restoring the playground. Um, it really enriches the experience of students at Jackson Street. And I, I want to thank you also for including students with disabilities in the conception of this from the beginning. Um, I also uh, want to commend you for your dedication to this. I've, as you know, and this is really for the benefit of the public and the committee. I've been weeding, meeting with you on essentially a monthly basis um, <laughs> since the start, and it has moved very quickly. But I think for me, the meeting that was most um, memorable was the one that happened as uh, Blizzard Juno was rolling in, <laughs> and I had just sent out this very dire warning to all staff to go home and prepare for the worst. Um, but you were like, no, we're having the meeting. Come down here. Um, and it was just amazing. Um, we stayed, I think, until 5 o'clock that night. Um, and it, I, I think it just speaks to your dedication to the project. And the third thing, um, this really is for the committee. Uh, if, I'm not sure if it's posted appropriately for this time, but if not, we could uh, handle it at the next meeting. Um, one of the things that came up at that meeting um, as the snowstorm was coming in was that if I could be authorized to sign contracts on behalf of the project as I am on behalf of the roof project, it would allow the um, work to move forward more quickly. So I would ask either at this meeting or at the next meeting for the committee to uh, give me that power. Would you like a motion made now? Because I'd be interested in making that motion. I mean, is it something that we have to put on the agenda to vote on next time? Well, I mean, we do have a gift on the agenda, so. So I would like to move that we uh, vote to accept the gift. Jackson, Second. Jackson Street PTO Playground funds. And again, say that I'm just really impressed with the funds that have been raised. And like uh, Ms. Duvall, uh, my, my kids enjoyed it for years. And so I'm kids. looking forward to future generations enjoying it once again. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ed. Mm -hmm. So there's been a motion made and seconded. Is there any other comments? I think what we, because it's not posted, we may want to just do that um, for the next meeting. Um, okay. uh, only because we didn't post that uh, as part of the agenda. Um, 
Is any further discussion on this? Okay, all those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Get out of here now. Uh, 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 any abstentions? Okay, it's uh, unanimously accepted with gratitude. Thank you so much. <clears throat> and can we just also say, and we neg I neglected to do this earlier, that um, we also really have to extend a huge thanks to the city personnel. The, the yeah. meeting that um, Dr. Provost was talking about was uh, attended wildly, wildly mm -hmm. by, um, by members of the maintenance department, the school maintenance department, the city folks, and they just stayed there. And mm -hmm. there's a lot of details in building a playground. Um, and they just were right there with us trying mm -hmm. to figure out all of the, um, the ways in which we're going to go out to bid and, and the way to make this as rich as an experience as possible. And again, it just takes a village. Um, and they are really key parts. And they're going to be really involved as we build this thing. Mm -hmm. So thank you. Starting with their snow plows. <laughs> <laughs> yes. right. thank you Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Now in that same, uh, moving on in the agenda, and we're gonna, we're actually gonna move an item up in the agenda in that same vein. Um, we also, tonight, will have the opportunity to vote on a gift uh, to the B uh, Bridge Street PTO for some uh, technology upgrades, and I'll turn to uh, Candace for that. Actually, we're gonna ask the principal of Bridge Street School, Beth Choquette, to come up and hand okay. a presentation on that for her building. Excellent. Oh, here's, okay. Hello, everybody. How are you? Hello. Nice Thanks. to see you all again. Um, I really, I, I don't know where to start um, when I when I talk about the the generosity of uh, the family of Marie Herskowitz, um, who passed away last year. Um, I would like to, before I get started to just introduce and and point out Dr. Melvin Herskowitz and Marie's husband Steve Hathaway, who are here tonight. Um, from the bottom of my heart, wonderful, wonderful people, and um, they did a lot with um, our whole playground um, re rebuilding. And now Dr. Hershkowitz um, has come to me um, because he wants to make a significant donation uh, to this to the PTO at Bridge Street School. And um, when we first met with the superintendent um about this you know, the first thing that uh, popped into my mind for bridge street was technology in the classrooms um we're really lacking at bridge street with technology and um so the money will be used for technology but um there i have uh, a, a couple things around that first of all the technology piece itself as you know technology is extremely expensive and it's very difficult to be able to furnish classrooms with technology in our school budgets um so that you know the reason why technology came to the forefront is you know because of the cost and how hard it is um to be able to build that into the budget the se second thing um when thinking about our plan for this was really about the kids um marie hershkowitz loved her job she loved teaching she loved the children and i really wanted this to be about the kids um so there's there's two two parts to it the, the technology piece um with dr hershkowitz's money we are going to going to be able to furnish all of our k through five classrooms um with a substantial amount of technology which i'll share with you in a moment but um Besides having the technology in the classroom, it's what are you going to do with it? And Bridge Street, um, our classrooms are very, uh, we do uh, center-based learning and teaching. We do a lot of small group instruction and uh, really focus on tiered instruction and, and the needs of the children. And so the technology in the classroom will allow classroom teachers to have technology learning centers in their classroom for students to be able to, to use. I also wanted to do something that was kind of outside of the box for students and um, this idea first came to me uh, from Dr. Provost and I don't know if you've ever heard of Genius Hour or Genius Bars. Um, it all originates from um, the Google initiative of their employees working 80% on Google projects but 20% on their own projects and with the students in mind we would incorporate a genius hour once a week that would be student driven and would allow students to research topics of interest to them that's not dictated by the common core it's not dictated um, by 
any state test, it would allow them to really take ownership of their learning. They would do the research and create and present and share um, with their classmates. So this really is a wonderful opportunity for us. Um, and I, I, again, I can't express enough how grateful I am to Dr. Hershkowitz for um, doing this for our school. And I hope that um, you approve the PTO of accepting these funds. Just to give you an idea of the technology that we're looking at, um, and this is for all the K through five classrooms at Bridge Street. Um, two iPads for every classroom, two um, Macintosh laptops for every classroom. There's money in there um, as well for teacher supplies and um, ink that would go along with printers for every classroom. Um, projectors, computer speakers for every classroom. Um, a, a set of headphones for every student K through five in the building. Um, our students do a lot of speech to text um, in the classrooms and um, headphones uh, with each child having their own. We have the idea is that they can travel with them year to year so we're not having to buy headphones for the same student year after year and um, and some furniture to be able to support some of this technology. Um, there's some tables and, and stools and whatnot in there. So. Um, we're very excited about this. We're very grateful for this, and um, we hope that you ex allow the PTO to accept the funds. The, the PTO, we, we would be accepting a gift from the PTO. Yes, yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, yes, exactly. Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, okay. I move uh, to accept. Okay. Is there a second on that? Second. Okay. So, um, any discussion or questions about this? So this is a gift that's, again, similar to the last one, a gift that's being made to the PTO. And the, P, I mean, the PTO is making the gift to the city schools. And so we would be accepting this gift. <coughs> I, I have something I would like to say. I just find it incredibly awesome that um, you're doing this, Dr. Hershowitz, in, in honor of your wife. Daughter. Daughter. daughter I'm sorry, your daughter. And um, it's. We've been pushing for a capital campaign and to try to get all the kids' technology. And what you're giving to them is so important. And it's just, it's such a building block for the rest of their lives. And I want to thank you for getting that going in all the classes. And we can have consistency and we can have, you know, um, vertical learning now. So thank you very, very, very much. I would just like to share. Um, my recollection of the first meeting where this idea came up um, because Dr. Hershowitz looked at us, we were in Beth's office, and he said, well, just imagine what you would really need to make it right for the kids and don't worry about the bottom line. And I thought, this has never happened in my career as an educator. Um, it is just an amazing demonstration of generosity for which I'm very grateful. And I'll echo that on behalf of the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so there's a motion made and seconded. Uh, any further discussion? All those in favor of accepting this generous gift, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? The gift is gratefully accepted. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Much. Okay. Um, the next item on the agenda, so we will go to your entry. Okay, excellent. So the next item on the agenda is we're going to just take a two-minute break so that we can set up the, um, the technology for the, uh, for the uh, superintendent's entry finding presentation. So we'll take a two-minute recess. So Thank we, you. go ahead. Uh, tonight is the culmination of a very important part of the process of my entry to the district, presentation of my entry findings. If you recall from the July meeting, I presented my entry plan, which is essentially a, a process of collecting information about the district to <coughs> sort of get the lay of the land in my new home. Um, this graphic is from the entry plan um, that was presented and accepted in July. It describes different types of evidence that I plan to collect in, in this first phase of my entry to the district. Um, testimonial was one type of 
information um, that was collected extensively throughout this through my meetings with individuals and through um, group processes. Also, I reviewed voluminous documents, um, which are all sitting in boxes in my office right now, um, and many of which are referenced in the um, work cited section of the document that you received in your packet. And then um, also observational data based on my opportunity to observe teaching and learning and practice in our schools. Um, so I hope that um, you'll find in the entry findings that the evidence presented represents um, elements that were present not only in one type of setting or one type of evidence, but overarching themes that occurred across many types of data sources and many types of data collection strategies. Um, so just to talk a little more depth about some of those. Um, the first process was interviews. Um, I met with over 90 people in the first few months of my administration. More than 40 of them were willing to go on the record and be recorded. Many of you in this room were, went on the record uh, and were recorded for that process. And uh, I was ask, asking really a series of five questions that would help me uh, get a sense of what was happening in the district. We also um, did parent forms, which were more group processes. This one, I think, happened in this room, um, where we were basically getting together with groups of parents to discuss essentially the same questions that I was asking in the interviews, um, but to give people an opportunity to reflect upon each other's thoughts and sort of expand the thinking and beyond just an interview format. And then we uh, also conducted a series of learning walkthroughs at buildings representing all of the instructional levels in the district. We didn't get to all the buildings, but we at least had elementary, middle, and high school covered. Um, this picture is from Mr. Whalen's class, and this, this is kind of a very sort of postmodern meta kind of thing for me because I was in the classroom observing the students and taking notes, and they were sort of taking pictures of me and posting it on the internet. So it was like, <laughs> who's the watcher and who's the watched? <laughs> um, so let me uh, get to the findings. First, um, there's a very strong support for the Northampton Public Schools from the community. I think that's obvious from the two items on our agenda that immediately came before this. Um, but just to add a little bit more to that, um, you should know that Northampton was one of only six municipalities in the Commonwealth that successfully obtained an override for education in 2014. Um, I think there were maybe a dozen communities altogether, but um, the rest of them were for things like police equipment or highway equipment. Um, but it, it's very rare for a community to pass an override that includes education in the mix. Um, so I think that speaks really to the values of the community and the support they have for public education. Also, um, over the past quarter century, the Northampton Public Schools has received more than a million dollars from the NEF. Um, and we have a number of very active PTOs that make donations to the schools on a monthly basis, um, as I've learned from, a tent, from the school committee meetings and just seeing the amazing gifts that come month after month after month. And it's really gratifying for me to be able to work here because of that. Also, um, we have something I've never seen before in any of the districts I've worked in, which is uh, a professional volunteer coordination service, VINS, um, which also contributes greatly to the schools. So I think there are a lot of people who are really interested in what we're doing and want to see the school succeed. My next uh, finding, this came from everybody, was that the teachers of our schools are our greatest asset. Um, this came even from people who felt that programs within the schools were weak um, or who had certain complaints about things that were happening within the district still said, but my kid had great teachers. And so in spite of everything else that may not have been less than ideal, my child did well 
because of the dedication of the teachers. So, and that, that was universal across parents, students, community members, everybody felt very strongly that teachers in the district are doing a great job for our kids. Um, another key finding is that impressed me as someone coming into the district is the strength of our foreign language program. Um, we've maintained a program in spite of the many years of economic hardship that affords students the opportunity for six or seven years of uninterrupted language study. You know, if you look at the curriculum frameworks, they're recommending more than six or seven years of uninterrupted language study, essentially beginning in the elementary school. But when you look at what districts have actually been able to provide, um, it's very rare um, that a, a district is able to maintain a language program as strong as the one we have at, be, below the high school level. In fact, the last time statistics were taken on this was a 2002 study by the Department of Education. So this was before the hard times that we've been through lately. And at that time, only 60 districts reported having any kind of language instruction below the seventh grade level. So I think that's, that's a real credit to the district and real strength of what we're doing here. Also, um, the diversity of our co-curricular programs is amazing. Um, when I came for my tour, on my first day of interviews, I was amazed to learn that you had three theaters in your high school. I've been in a lot of high schools across the state, and I don't think I've ever seen another one with three theaters. In fact, the college where I did my undergraduate work only had two theaters. <laughs> uh, so, and, and it's not just about spaces, obviously. It's about the kids and the things they do. Oh. And it, rarely a week goes by that I don't read in the paper or see on, on the internet an, another arts-related activity that our kids are doing. So I, I think that that is a real strength of the district. Um, another another uh, finding, and this one was really kind of pointed because in my interviews with parents, one of the things that came up repeatedly was they wanted to know whether the district's focus on differentiated instruction was having any kind of an impact, which is why when we did our classroom observations, we chose a rubric that is really designed to look at um, the types of differentiation that teachers are providing to kids. And um, I can say that the DI professional development that we're doing is definitely having an impact. You know, I can't say what it was like last year because I wasn't here, but I can tell you that when we go into classrooms, we see differentiated instruction happening. In fact, um, in the entry findings, you'll find summaries of observations. We looked at 17 classrooms across, across all grade levels. We had 24 educators who had been trained in this process to help with the um, observations. So it wasn't all administrators. In fact, it was mainly teachers who were making these observations. And we saw teachers utilizing a wide range of instructional strategies, including explicit instruction, alternating whole group and small group activities, utilizing manipulatives and technologies to make content accessible to more learners. Oh. Not sure what's happening there. <coughs> Thank you. <laughs> now I can't advance it though. Okay, there we go. Um, another key finding is that we offer a really strong athletic program. I know we've talked in these meetings about some of the um, unique ways in which it's financed and, and some of the structures that we'd like to strengthen as we go into budget season in order to improve um, the stability of the programs. But um, we offer many more sports than I've seen at a lot of, in a lot of the districts I've worked, including some sports that are not even sanctioned by MIAA, like Ultimate Frisbee. Um, 
But I, I, I just remember in one of my interviews at the beginning when Jim Miller was still the athletic director, him saying, you know, by size we're Division Two, but in most sports we play Division One teams because we want to compete with the best. And I think that's really, really a fine attitude, not only for the athletic program, but I think it sort of exemplifies what Northampton is all about. And I can't make it go again. <laughs> So uh, the next finding is that we have an exceptional advanced placement program. I, ha I caught some data on this in sort of a roundabout way um, from another superintendent. Um, as I'm sure many of you who've known many superintendents have realized we're competitive by nature. And sometimes we sit around on weekends comparing our districts to other districts. And I got this email at like 11.30 one Friday night. And the superintendent said, you know, I was studying your school to see how we measure up. And um, so I'll just quote from the email. She said, I was looking at AP participation and performance and wanted to get a sense of how we stacked up compared to surrounding districts. Northampton is really impressive. The, t the 2014 accountability data indicate 310 students taking tests, 626 uh, um, taken in almost 80% of your students scoring three or better. You've just over a third of your student population taking AP tests. That's the highest in Hampshire County and the second best performance uh, in the county. Another district, which you won't name, has over 90% of its students scoring three or better, but they have only 13% of their students participating. So I think that's a, a very, um, very exceptional and noteworthy strength of our district. So now moving into findings that <coughs> indicate some challenge. Um, we have an absence, really, of a written curriculum in all subjects and grade levels. And that has limited our ability to educate all students according to a common set of learning expectations. That came out to me in my interviews with parents where they would say, you know, I had multiple children go through the same school and they got very different experiences. They all said they were good, but they said from teacher to teacher there was, a, you know, a great deal of variance. Um, it wasn't surprising to me because I had already asked for the curriculum. Um, one of the first things I asked for when I got here. And this is one of the documents I received. Um, it's probably one of the better documents I received. It's the seventh grade English language arts curriculum. You know, the date on that is 2004. The Massachusetts curriculum frameworks have changed since 2004. So um, that's out of date. But as I indicated, at least there was something there for that grade level in that subject. There are many grade levels and subjects where um, people were unable to produce documents. Or there's even one case where I'd asked for a curriculum of a subject that would be pretty critical. And um, none of the principals knew where it was. One principal said, I think I have one. And others said, could you send me copies too? Um, so that's kind of a, an indication of the disarray around curriculum. And, one of the reasons why I've supported the district decision that was made prior to my getting here to um, work on getting an explicit written standard curriculum that um, will reduce the probability of students' education being dependent totally on what teacher they happen to get that year. Another finding is that we've experienced higher than average turnover rates among teachers and administrators in recent years. You can see these are the different buildings, um, and these are just teachers. Um, that line going across the middle is a, at 15% is the statewide average. So you can see that in a lot of years, we had a lot of schools that were much above statewide average. In fact, you have some schools, uh, like Leeds, that had multiple years that were close to 20 or 25%. Now, some of those are the same positions being replaced over and over again, but it means 
You know, if you have four years of 25% turnover, you're essentially replacing the entire faculty. Um, so that, that is disruptive um, to schools. It's difficult to continue uh, making progress within schools when you're experiencing that kind of turnover. We're experiencing that kind of turnover not only among the teaching ranks, but also among the administrative ranks. Um, we've gone through a number of principals and a number of superintendents. Um, the research on this is that it takes about five to seven years of a leader being in position <clears throat> in order to really effectively make demonstrable impact upon uh, a school or a district. And so when you have administrators that have a shorter lifespan than that, it means that you're not really getting uh, effective progress because um, they're never reaching the point where they would be uh, as effective as they could be. Does that inter include retirements, Mr. Superintendent? I assume that turnover includes retirement. It does. Just normal attrition. Yeah. yeah, it's for all reasons. And that, just to talk a little bit more, one of the things we see um, from the entry findings is when we do the histogram distributing teachers by age, we have a, a number of teachers that are nearing retirement age. So it's predictable that we're going to continue to see um, high turnover in a number of schools for a number of years going forward. So I think when we get to the point of developing strategies, um, working very hard on induction may well turn out to be one of those strategies. So an, another key finding is that there's been a tremendous change of demographics within the district over the past decade or so. Um, increasingly, this, the students that Northampton Public Schools serve are low income, or not just low income, but high need students, which include low income, students with disabilities, and English language learners. Um, when you look at that group, um, you can see year over year over year, it's steadily increasing. I can tell you that much of the information that was included in the school profiles in the entry findings was collected in September. Since then, um, the December count shows that in almost every category of risk, um, the student population has increased in the schools. So we're on a, a pretty rapid trajectory of increasing numbers of high need students. And so I put the regression line in this diagram to just show you, you can see we can conceive of a point before too many more years where the majority of students within the district would be high need students. Um, another way of looking at that is by grade level. Um, if this is kind of like, you know, a astronomer looking into space and as you're looking back, you're looking in time. When you're looking at your older grades, you're looking at what the community was like at an earlier point of time. And you can see as we go to the younger and younger grades, there's a general increase. It's not every year, but in general, an increase in the num percentage of student, of high need students enrolled by the district. Probably the most, um, most notable is our current second grade class where over 60% of our kids are high-need students. Um, so that's, that's a trend for the future we need to plan for. And um, one of the things that makes it even more important to plan for it is the overall achievement gap between high-need students and their non-high-needs peers has remained constant or increased over the past several years. So, these next couple of charts kind of toggle back and forth. Um, but this is the English language arts achievement of our non-high need students. You can see that in general, if you're not high needs, you're not in danger of not passing the MCAS. You may get a needs improvement, but it's very unlikely. It, more than 90% of our non-high need students um, are able to to either be proficient or advanced. Here's English language arts for high needs kids. Um, and you can see that there, about half of the kids are not proficient or advanced. And you can see that there isn't really perceptible movement over the years to say that that, that 
is changing much. Um, the numbers of advanced need, proficient needs improvement and warning in 2014 really don't look a lot different than they did in 2011. This is what it looks like in math. In math, it's somewhat of a different story. The non-high needs students shown here are definitely making progress towards, um, towards proficiency in, a, in advanced status. You can see every year there's incremental growth in our non-high need students showing higher and higher achievement. When you look at our non-high need, I mean, sorry, when you look at our high need students, you see that it is staying flat or getting worse year after year. And this is a group that's representing a ever bigger portion of the students we educate. So then to look at science, again, here are non-high needs. Again, virtual, virtually everybody passes, maybe with a warning, I mean, sorry, maybe with a needs improvement, but not in the warning category. And then here's high needs. Um, consistently, a quarter are in the warning failing category. In fact, more in the warning fa failing category now than in 2011. So um, it seems that we're not serving their needs very well. Here's another way to look at that. This is the, um, if you remember when I presented the MCAS data this year, I showed the growth and achievement charts. And I just gave sort of one bubble for each grade and let them move across over time. But this actually looks at subgroups. And just to bring you back in time to that conversation, remember the upper right-hand quadrant is the good quadrant. That's high growth and high achievement, best place you can be. The bottom left is low growth and low achievement, worst place you can be. Um, and this one splits it by high needs and non-high needs status. So here we're looking at math, we're looking at mathematics, the um, the non-high need students are right in the sweet spot of where you'd like them to be, and the high need students are, are stuck not only with low growth, but low achievement. Um, I think that's, a, that's a, a pretty telling graphic. It's a tale of two districts, really. Um, if you look at English language arts, it's, it's, a, it's a significantly different picture. Um, here, it seems like the distance between the high needs and the non-high needs peers is less. You can see that that high needs group is sort of on the verge of breaking over to the high growth, high achievement quadrant. Um, but in this one, it's, it's still important to pay attention to that group because you'll see that the non-high needs bubble has almost reached the top of the graph, which means the only way for the district to make any more improve, further improvement is to focus on the high needs kids because the non-high needs have pretty much maxed out their ability to perform. So moving on to special education, um, our spending on special education has been relatively high in an era of more or less flat budgets. You can see that special ed has taken um, a larger and larger portion of the overall school budget over recent years. And the, in, this, in this graphic, the darker blue is Northampton's special ed percentage, and the lighter blue is the state average. So you can see there, were, there was a one time where we kind of plateaued, and then it looks like maybe we started to bend the curve a little bit in the last year, but um, special ed spending is a little bit higher than would be expected. Um, one reason for this may be the um, overall identification rate of kids with disabilities that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, second finding, also with respect to special ed, is that we imp implement a less inclusive service delivery model. Um, what this graphic shows, this is from the state's special education um, accountability site. And here, this is a type of accountability that has nothing at all to do with standardized high stakes testing. All this accountability is based on is looking at the students' IEPs and where their IEPs place them. 
And the standard that the state has set is that 80% of the students with disabilities should be spending 80% or more of the time with their non-disabled peers. That, in this map, is represented by the lightest color blue. Um, and you can see, as you come farther and farther away from that standard, your color gets darker and darker. And in our immediate area, you can see that Northampton is the darkest, which is not good. Um, our full inclusion rate right now is not the 80% that the, the state has targeted for us, but it's 54%. I'm sorry, 50.4%. So there's, um, there's something in our service delivery model that prevents kids from being included with their non-disabled peers. And we're identifying more kids as having disabilities than would be expected. So our identification rate in Northampton is about 22%. If you look on the DART districts, which are districts that the state has identified through an algorithm as being comparable to Northampton, you'd see that the um, rate for them is closer to 20. If you look at districts within, I think I looked at districts that were with half a percentage point of Northampton in terms of low income incidence, because we know that low income incidence has high comorbidity with disabilities. Um, you see that the rate is 16.7%, or if you look at the statewide average, 17.1%. So whatever standard of comparison you take, Northampton is high. So <clears throat> identifying too many kids, spending too much money, and not allowing them access to uh, non-disabled peers. Can we ask a question? A sure. John, I'm curious about this. Um, have you thought about the, the number of charter schools around the area with a lower, per I know you're going to show this, a lower percentage of special needs, and we send so many students to these that our percentages are therefore higher? I think that's definitely a driver. I think that um, there are probably some other drivers, too, because in order in order to be identified with a disability, it means that you're not making effective progress in the general curriculum. You know, I think that there, are, as we investigate this, we will probably find that there are some components within our general education curriculum that are becoming barriers to lots of kids. But I do think that we're also seeing um, some inflation of our in, uh, special ed incidents based on the fact that kids who are going to charter schools in our community typically are not kids with disabilities. And we're going to be, as you said, there's a slide that talks about that in a minute. Thank you. Yes. Does school choice coming in also affect it potentially? Is, are we accepting more students with disabilities? No. Uh, school choice is done by lottery. Um, you're not, it, it's unlawful to discriminate um, on the basis of disability when you're doing your enrollment in the school choice program. So I don't think that. Well, I just didn't know if more students were applying for the lottery because we were delivering better services potentially than the areas that have the lighter color surrounding us. I, I did not look at that question. Um, so certainly that's something we could study. Does it include both um, 504 and IEPs? No, these are just IEPs. Just IEPs. Well, it might be the opposite. It may be that we're not applying the eligibility criteria as strictly as possible. Um, you know, one of, the, one of the things that happens sometimes, um, and this actually was in some of the prior findings um, of, that, I re that I looked at in doing this research, sometimes when support systems and other types of interventions are thought to be weak, special education can become a go-to, um, whether or not it's because of a child's disability. Um, there was a report that said, um, teachers said, this was from the Joe Rapper report, teachers said special education was, quote, the only game in town for kids who are struggling. You know, uh, it could be the opposite, too. I mean, there are, um, I think, some teams that are reluctant to refer because they think what they're doing is a stronger intervention 
than what's available in special ed. But you know, that certainly is when we get into the next step of this, which is identifying root causes, it's exactly the type of question we'll be asking. Um, so, so then I threw this in to say that you know, it's not all special ed. You know? See, the other area that's increasing in our per pupil spending by function is insurance and retirement. Um, it's actually the one that's growing the greatest. But you see that causes other things to have to remain flat or go down, including critical things like technology. Uh, so getting to the charter school issue, um, one of the things that was surprising to me to learn was that with the um, exception of the Chinese immersion school, in the category of um, English language learners, all of the charter schools that people are sending their kids to in the area are enrolling lower portions of kids with any of these risk factors. So that gets to the, that gets to the question of, well, did, is that sort of leaving a remainder population that's skewed because all these, all these non-high-needs kids are sort of choosing out. And then also related to the issues of charters and choice, it's just the economic impact. This shows the overall choice bite that um, charter schools, or say charter bite that charter schools take out of the school budget. You can see that it's been steadily increasing every year since FY 2007. Um, and it's due in part because of enrollment and due in part because of the way the formula works. I know that recently, uh, as part of 9C cuts, the state reimbursement to local communities for charter schools was cut. I'm not exactly sure what the impact on Northampton is going to be from that yet, but it's not good. And as I said at the PSAC meeting on Tuesday night, we're not innocent in this either. Um, as a way to try to um, offset the losses that <coughs> we've experienced due to charters and a little bit to choice, we've become an ever hungrier um, consumer of, of choice monies from other districts um, contributing to the instability in their communities. So we've also been on an ever increasing um, diet of bringing in choice kids to sort of help stabilize our budget. So all in all, there are about 17 findings um, when you sort of boil down all of the, all the matter that's in that the 60 page of the report. Um, I want to talk a little bit about next steps. The first is just to validate the findings by talking to people and saying, you know, does this seem like the district you know. And that'll be one of the things I want to ask you tonight. Um, I, it, it really is embedded in evidence, data, both um, quantitative and qualitative. I, I hope you heard, in some cases, it was members of, of this committee and people sitting in this room whose voices were quoted back in the report. So I hope you find that I got the district basically the way it is. Then we'll um, choose the issues that we think are most pressing to work on for the future of the district and drill down to what their causes are. Um, because although these findings are all very important, they're only the beginning. They're all symptoms of something. Um, even the positive symptoms are symptoms of something. We want to find out what are the drivers that cause the, the district to behave the way it does and show us the, the characteristics it does. We'll prioritize um, a limited number of critical issues that we want to work on, and then um, in a collaborative process, develop the next district improvement plan to take us forward in the next three to five years. So I guess I just want to close by asking members of this committee, is this the district that you know and love? I was just going to say, I think, I think I wasn't surprised by a lot of the 
the key points that you've brought up. We've all known that the special education funding is, is on the rise, um, the funding, <laughs> the cost us is on the rise. We know that the charter schools have been an issue. We knew that the curriculum, and we've had presentations um, about that. I feel like none of this was surprising, and then it reflects the reality that's been presented over the, what, four or five months I've been here. Um, and so, I, yeah, I thought, I thought it was a well done. Clearly you've researched <coughs> thoroughly. <clears throat> I would just say that I think it showed me at least two things. One is that we do have a great district and we do have a lot of positive things. But there are a lot of things that some may not realize we really need to work on. And I think those are the things that we need to bring to the forefront of those who don't see it and don't know that the um, higher need students are falling more and more behind. So I think uh, it's important to bring that up to everyone's attention. I also wanted to congratulate you and, and thank you. It's a very thorough and I would encourage members of the public when it goes online, not just the presentation, but to actually take the time to read the full <coughs> the full report that you put together. I think it's, um, you, you mentioned it briefly in the presentation, but just sort of the the tale of two districts and and you've sort of broken it down by, by school, by elementary level, by grade level, and there's some really interesting things that are happening, um, including, which you didn't get into a lot here, but just sort of the, the changing demographics from the elementary level, where we lose a lot of people um, who, who go, who choose other options, private schools, parochial schools, charter schools. Um, and then suddenly at the high school level, we have this influx of 21, 22 percent of the ninth graders are coming to the high school from somewhere else. So it's really a it's an interesting um, shift in the, in, the, in the student population. So it really is, uh, in, this is very important for people to understand and very important as we talk about where we're gonna focus resources and how we get to these root causes when we uh, begin to analyze them. So thank you very much for this. Yes. Can I just say one more thing? The one, the one thing that struck me watching all this, because we keep focusing on how the, the gap is getting wider between high need students and other students. But, but these findings are all based on the MCAS scores, right? Well, the ones that have to do with student achievement that I talked about tonight right. are. Okay. In the report, the full report, I also talked about other measures of achievement, including SAT and AP scores and post secondary outcomes in terms of college persistence and enrollment. Were those gaps widening for those measures? I just have, I have a hard time believing that that's, that the MCAS is necessarily <coughs> presenting an accurate picture of what the high needs students are actually capable of achieving or are getting out of their education, but I don't know what the other indicators showed. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look at the tables that talk about college persistence of high school graduates at the one year mark and at the 16 um, month mark. Those are broken down by all the different demographic categories, and um, you'll see some, some patterns there. One of the things I noticed was that there is a gap in enrollment initially um, where sort of your students without any risk factors enroll at a higher rate, but 16 months later, um, many of those students have gotten out of the higher ed system. Um, the um, students who go in with higher risk factors <clears throat> enroll at a lower rate, but they have more stability over that time. So I thought that was interesting. I have no idea what causes that, but um, it, it's an interesting finding. Mr. Moore? Right. I'd like to add, um, I think people really should read the report if they can, in addition to seeing this presentation, because it has a lot of details that aren't in here and that are really interesting. They, they, don't, they, they raise a lot of questions. I think one that struck out in my mind was, the, in the report, there's a breakdown of the um, absentee rate, sort of by school and by subgroup of students. And it's interesting, it's hard to know, you know, chicken and egg sort of discussion in terms of, you know, whether what's driving the absenteeism or what the absenteeism is driving. But um, that's the kind of example of the kind of really interesting information that I think when you talk about trying to figure out sort of, you know, where the beginning is. On those kinds of things, um, it'll be, it, it could be very fruitful. Other comments or discussions? Yeah, 
I would just like to say thank you, Dr. Provost, for putting this together. Um, I think it really gives us as a school committee an opportunity to um, take the information and, and move it forward as, as we look to continue to create uh, great access to public education here in Northampton and to, to continue to look at some of those areas that we've, we've found problematic before. I mean, um, <coughs> we've known for many years that we have an achievement gap between uh, different uh, groups in our school and um, having those areas identified as we move forward and look at a uh, district improvement plan and <coughs> coming up I think will be really helpful for us to keep in mind as we make some of those decisions. So thank you. I just had a question about whether this two streams of students in a single district is a problem that you discuss with other superintendents because clearly looking at you know the districts that are comparable to us there's a similar degree of separation you know in some places it's greater in ELA versus math and uh, less pronounced than ours different trends but it seems like it's it's a common problem it, it is a common problem. <clears throat> Northampton is not unique with respect to that. I think the one thing that probably does make Northampton unique is the, the sort of churning of enrollment that happens, which I do think is, is different. Um, it, just you know, to put a finer point on it, it's not unusual for the non-high need students to do, be doing better on just about every measure than the high need students. But um, it is unusual to have sort of an exodus of non-high need students in the elementary level and then a return at ninth grade. And I do think that creates a unique dynamic um, for us and a unique challenge. Um, speaking with one of the administrators at the high school, he made this comment that, you know, I thought should make in the, it into the report, but I could never figure out where to fit in the quote. He said, you know, as I look in my school as an administrator, we're more bifurcated now than we've ever been before. And I think that, um, that creates a unique challenge for us. Ms. Duvall. Um, I'd like to say thank you very much for doing a very inclusive and thorough job. I like not only how it's being compared to the state and the, the other, um, our district, but also how it's, we can learn from the different schools, how um, <coughs> Ryan Road has seems to by the graph that I was looking at consistently done pretty well in math and maybe we can see how we can learn further to um, see if we can get them more equal um, of you know whichever school um, helps learn off of each other so I want to thank you very much for that and um, it's just fascinating the information that's in here because it offers so many more questions and I attended two of your parent forums and um, I saw how you translated it into the report, and I am in awe. It was it was such a night of you know organized chaos in a way, and you made it very very specific. And I just really appreciate the clarity with which you did this. Thank you. Sorry. Just quickly, uh, this is a great report, and it's a great story you told. And the, like Laura said, there's nothing surprising to me, but I think what is really important for the community to really look at is. Um, the real specific issues that you're bringing up with respect to the, the exodus at the ele elementary level. And we're, I work in another system, as you know, and we, we have those same issues. You're dealing with high need students, and how do we get those together? And I just think getting it out like you are and addressing it head on, and these next steps are just a great first um, step in the process. So I really appreciate what you did. Thank you. Any other uh, comments? <coughs> okay. Thank you. So um, we'll just reshift our seats here, and uh, we want to do a. Um, okay, I think we'll take a. Um, we'll take another two-minute recess, into, so that we can uh, take down the technology and get back to our technology. So welcome back to the uh, Northampton School Committee meeting of Thursday, February 12th, 2015. We are now picking uh, back up in the agenda following the superintendent's uh, entry findings presentation. 
We have another gift before you. This is a required vote uh, to accept a gift. Um, this is uh, from NCTV, and this is for hardware for uh, uh, NHS technology. And I'll ask uh, the school business administrator to discuss this. Yep, the first two gifts that we have here were actually two that were mentioned earlier this evening by Jeremy Whalen. The first one is from the Northampton Community Television for the uh, emergency drive for the IMAC. Um, if I can get these two together since they've been mentioned already. And the second one was from um, Siobhan, if I'm saying that right, um, the SD storage device that was donated to the technology program at the high school also. Okay. All right, move to approve these two gifts. Second. Any discussion or questions about accepting these two gifts for the high school? Hearing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, those gifts are, are gratefully accepted. Next, there's a gift from Packards of $1,000 for special education at the high school. Hmm. Uh, discuss that. This, this is one that Packards has made each year for the last couple of years. Um, I'm not sure exactly how far it goes back, but I know this is at least the third year when I check back into the records. And they make a donation each year of $1,000 to the special ed program at the high school. And in discussions with the staff this year, what they're going to be doing is buying some Chromebooks to keep within the special ed department to use in those classrooms. So this is going to allow them to extend the technology in the special ed department there. I move to accept the Packards gift. Second. Uh, any discussion other than to thank uh, Robert McGovern, the owner of Packards, for his uh, ongoing generosity to this particular program, which I know is very special to him? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? Okay, the gift is accepted. Next, we have a gift from L3KEO, which uh, some of you may remember used to be called Cole Morgan Corporation. Uh, and this is a $2,500 gift for the robotics team. And again, I'll have you speak to this. This is another one that has been an annual gift coming forth from Cole Morgan. This is the third year, again, from what I could tell on this donation. And this goes to substantially support the robotics program. It's a good share of the funding that this program gets to keep going. And we heard mention earlier tonight from Jeremy Whalen about the success of that program. Move to approve the L3 Keo gift. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Any abstentions? OK. And as noted earlier, we've already taken uh, care of the Bridge Street PTO gift. So we'll now move to the business administrator's report along with the personnel report. Okay, um, there were two items noted in the report. You've got the monthly financial report before you. Um, I mentioned as we get later in the year, we do start to see deficits in some specific areas of the budget, but overall the budget appears to me at this point to still be in good shape. It's always a dangerous term to use when you're talking about it. But, um, I did look a little further into some of the defi deficits that show on the report that was before you. And one of them, for example, the um, professional development leadership about half the page where you see a deficit of about $40,000. That actually is attributed to one of the things I had mentioned in my report. As I've worked on straightening out some of the budget issues and classifying some of the positions in accordance with the updated Department of Ed reporting requirements, this is one that was affected. We had, you had created some positions in the budget this year for curriculum integration specialists and that money was actually funded in a different area of the budget. But as we looked at what those jobs were doing, they're actually providing professional development support for the staff to integrate the technology and the curriculum. So the, the positions were classified as professional development, and at some point I will get the funds transferred from where they were appropriated into here. But for now, it's showing on the report as a deficit. It's purely due to the realignment of things with the Department of Ed reporting categories. Another one that jumped out is the second one from the bottom. There's a, a, a small deficit under maintenance and repair, equipment repair and replacement. As I dug into this, it actually is a misnaming of the account functions. And I've worked with the city and we've got these corrected. The one right above it that's labeled utility should actually be heat. And the one that he, that's here is he labeled, that, excuse me, the one that is here labeled equipment repair and replacement is actually utilities, the electricity, water, sewer. And the reason there's a deficit there also goes to something mentioned in my report, that as I try to align the budget so that we can get a more consistent history over time, the utility bills are all being put into the local budget rather than some here, some there, and some there. 
Um, so by moving them back from the school choice revolving into the local budget, we're going to see a deficit in utilities, but we'll be realigning that with some other things going into school choice as we go through the year. So we will get the names have been corrected, and on the next report, we'll show as heat and utilities. So those were probably the major highlights. Special ed, as we mentioned, is still an issue with the tuitions being in deficit, but we're continuing to work basically to identify other sources that we can transfer into the special ed tuition area. Okay. Any questions for the business administrator about her report? Okay. The, the second piece of the report was just the distribution of where our teachers fall on the salary schedule, and this probably will be something as we go into budget that will be more useful to us as we look at the number of teachers that are due to have step increases as part of our budget process. And then the last piece is the personnel report. So during the month of January, we had um, we hired a long-term substitute English teacher at the high school to fill in for somebody who's on a sabbatical. We have a uh, ESP hired at Bridge Street Elementary School. And then also, I don't think everybody's met him yet. We'll have to arrange that at some point. But we've hired our new school supervisor, supervisor of school maintenance, Tony Kuzniers, who actually started about the middle of January and has jumped in and is getting his feet wet quickly dealing with um, heating issues in particular in the building. So we, we welcome Tony on staff. We had a separation of a fifth grade teacher who has resigned from the district. And we've also, I'm going to leave the retirements for a minute, we had two promotions, we'll say, and two substitute employees who moved into becoming ESPs in the district this month. And then we had three retirements that happened. So we have um, Susan Lucy, who was an ESP at Ryan Road School. Susan worked for the district for 31 years. Um, Bonnie Kingsley, who was an ESP at Northampton High School, she worked for the district for 23 years. And then also Greg Kushan, who retired as the supervisor of school maintenance and had previously been in our maintenance department, and he worked for the district for 18 years. So we lost three employees with a lot of service to Northampton. Okay. Any uh, questions or discussion about the personnel report? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I think we now will play musical chairs again and uh, reset up our technology. So uh, we will. Um, Again, take a brief recess, uh, one to two minutes, so that we can get the technology set up again for the next presentation. <laughs> I mean, you're in the way. Recess. Okay, so we're now back out of recess and turning the, uh, the podium and PowerPoint projector back over to the superintendent for a presentation on bus ridership headcounts and projections. Thank you. So. Earlier this evening, I presented on my entry findings, which is a typical part of a process for a superintendent coming into a district. This is uh, part of the process that was unique to Northampton. Um, as I was coming in, the outgoing superintendent made sure I understood that um, the committee wanted some actual headcount information about ridership on the district to be presented just prior to the beginning of the first budget meetings so that um, we could have some information about what the potential impact of a late start at the high school could be. So uh, I'm sorry for all the words on this slide, but that, I'll be honest, they're there to remind me as, as much as to inform you. I know many of you have been a part of this discussion for a long time and know many of these concepts, but I'll review them for um, the folks at home. Um, some key features of transportation contracts is, are that all routes a round trip. Um, you'll notice when we get into the head counts that the um, ridership on the morning and the afternoon in different buses at different schools can vary quite a bit. Um, but one of the things you can't do in order to minimize your impact is say, we need more buses in the morning or we need more buses in the afternoon. If you need them for either the morning or the afternoon, you have to buy them for both trips. Um, so that's why you'll see when we get to the actual head counts, I highlighted the, the days where we had the heaviest ridership, whether it was in the morning or in the afternoon, because those are the days that we have to plan for when uh, developing the bus contracts, or not the bus contracts, but ordering off the bus contracts for next year. Um, another thing to bear in mind is there are really two types of transportation that the district provides. One is what's known as regular transportation. Um, this is made of defined routes, 
with specified stops. Multiple riders get on and off at each stop. Sometimes when riders contact our office, they may change their uh, stop either to get on or to get off the bus, but that doesn't change the route. The route stays the same. The, um, the buses ride the same routes every day, whether or not the students get on and, and whether or not where they get on. Special transportation is different. Um, this is door-to-door -door service for students with special needs that affect their ability to access regular transportation. It can be only authorized by an IEP or Section 504 team, and that, um, that type of transportation is defined by the plan. And many times, it includes special components of, uh, of the transportation in addition to the route, such as special services that may need to be provided for the child while he's en route. Um, because schools start at different times, a single bus can have multiple routes. Those are known as tiers. We're gonna be talking a lot about tiers uh, tonight. Um, so just a term of art that I wanna make sure everyone's clear about. In transportation contracts, the first tier is always the most costly and subsequent tiers are discounted heavily, which is really what um, drives districts into in a, cost-saving mode to have tiered bus routes. Um, a, one of the, so one of the benefits is that once you've bought the first tier, the other tiers are much less costly. One of the downsides is that in a tiered system, um, you always end up with excess capacity on some of your smaller tiers in order to meet the needs of the larger tiers. Because if you're running buses on several tiers, it's really whatever the highest ridership tier is that drives the whole rest of the system. In our system, it's JFK. Um, we're essentially buying buses for JFK and adding tiers for the other schools. Even though they start right now uh, at the high school, you have to think that when we think about how we're buying them, we're buying them for JFK. Um, the, this cost structure with the tiering and the discounting for additional tiers usually makes um, purchasing the, this excess capacity, even though you're buying more buses than you need, cheaper than contracting for just the right sized fleet. You could have many fewer buses if you were just buying what each school needs individually for its, um, for its own students, but you'd be paying so much more for each of those each of those individual one-tier routes that it would cost you more money to run fewer buses. Um, so most people say, why not pay less money and run more buses? It gives us the additional benefit of some flexibility to add kids or, or move around routes later on in the year if we need to. Okay. So then I also want to um, share with you some data about start time. Um, this is data from the National Center on Educational Statistics. Um, they collect start time data based on intervals of high school size. The interval that Northampton High School fits in is the 750 to 999 student interval. And you can see that the average start time for schools in this size are, is 753. Um, if you look at the histogram, we appear in that 730 to 759 range, which is on the earlier end. And it's certainly below the average time for a school of our size. Um, so it is an early start time. Um, it's interesting, when you look at it broken down by size, there's a very strong correlation to size and time. And, um, the smaller schools tend to have later start times and the larger schools tend to have earlier start times. So this is from a sample, this is a nationwide sample. Okay, so last March, um, the, the school committee can, uh, reviewed the Tyler Technologies Report, also known as the Versatrans Report. The focus of that report was to see if we could implement a later start time in a cost neutral or low cost way for the district by moving from a three tiered system to a two tiered system for regular transportation. Um, the report did not in, uh, address the impact on special transportation. It didn't um, 
consider the cost estimates um, based on the current contracts that are in place for our transportation. Um, they were specifically looking at a hub proposal um, in which high school riders that lived within 1.49 miles of an elementary school would walk to the elementary school um, or, and then ride buses from the elementary school to the high school. Students who lived more than 1.49 miles from um, an elementary school would be picked up by the bus, brought to the elementary school, and then continue on to the high school. So it, it wasn't truly two tiers. There still were some buses that were running on three tiers, but it did reduce the number of buses that were on three tiers significantly in, in regular ed. Um, in the afternoon, um, you said the hub sort of flipped. Um, high school students would be transported to JFK where they could transfer to another bus to go back to the elementary and then walk home from there. Or if they were in the JFK neighborhood, they could walk home directly from JFK. So um, my understanding is that the committee was reviewing this report and it came up uh, that the report was based on all pass holders for the system. And the question was, well, should we build it for all pass holders or should we build it for kids who are actually riding the bus? Um, at that time, the school committee requested an actual head count, and so that's what I'm here to talk about tonight. So before I get to that, I just want to give you an idea of what the hub system looks like. So there, the uh, re regular transportation in the system um, are the big buses. These are the recommendations from the Versatrans report. The small buses were not included in the Versatrans report. Those are the special ed vans. We added those when um, trying to analyze this proposal for you. One of the things we found was that um, we would have to add significantly to the special ed transportation because even though we have excess capacity on the regular transportation, that we could sort of squeeze by going to a fewer tiered system. Doing that would cause our special ed vans to become overcrowded because they would also be on fewer tiers. So we'd have to send more of them out at once. So that's what the hub system looks like in the morning. This is what the hub system would look like in the afternoon. And then I'll give you the actual head counts. Can I ask a question? Yes. Um, in the afternoon, for Leeds, there are less of the um, special ed buses, the small buses. That's correct. Because in the morning, remember, um, some of the kids would have to be going from their home to Leeds to the high school. In the afternoon, we put two buses at the high okay, school. So I see they that would now. Just transport them directly instead of bringing them back to Leeds to continue on. Um, so, the methodology we used for this was to take AM and PM headcounts on each bus for a sample week each month. Um, we figured that it would be good to take the data for at least a whole week each month because there might be differences from day to day. We wanted to see all the days in the week. We thought there might be differences from month to month, so we wanted to see what all the months looked like. So. The only time we changed that third month methodology, I think, was in November. I mean, that third week methodology was in November because of the holiday. We didn't want to lose those days. I think we, we moved it up to the second week in November. So we had 25 days included in the sample. That's 50 head counts because you have a morning and an afternoon. Because of the number of individual routes, we had over 1,000 route tallies that were included. So I think it is a very valid sample. There's some. Um, statistical testing you can look at to, to um, test the validity of your sample, but I did not get into any of that because it was clear from the just looking at the numbers that we were getting redundant counts. It was the same count day after day after day or very similar counts. So we knew that was really the ridership. Um, the one problem we had with our methodology is this doesn't include spring. Um, we know there are more sp sports in spring that could affect the, the actual ridership, um, either way, I don't know. Uh, we, but we, I think for the 
the sample period we have, we've got it right on the, right on the head of what it is. So looking at head counts by route, full-size buses, the high school in the morning, the maximum daily ridership, which is the day in which the most students rode buses, single day, was the first day we, we did this count. We had 125 kids on five full-size buses. Um, so there are two ways you can think about how to plan for this. One is you plan for your heaviest impact day and say, okay, that's as bad as it'll ever get. As long as we can transport that many kids, we'll be okay. Another way, which is slightly more conservative, and I think probably uh, a better estimate to go by is maximum route ridership, which says take your highest day on each of the individual routes and say, what if they all occurred on the same day? You know, it's sort of like the perfect storm scenario. Um, so um, I would say on the high school, we need to plan for 142 ideally, but at minimum 125 kids. That's the, the morning route. Um, I didn't put any counts on the PM. I mean, you have the individual counts, but I didn't put any totals on the PM because in the PM routes are never as big as the AM routes on any individual route or on any individual day. So it's really the high school in the morning <coughs> that you have to plan for. So continuing on to JFK, their maximum ridership occurred in October, day six. They had 272 riders in the morning. Um, in the afternoon, they also had a day that was 272. That was the first day uh, that we took the count. So we definitely need to have room for at least 272 at JFK. But if you consider the perfect storm scenario of all of the high days lined up, um, 336 might be a, a safer number to, to go with. And you can see on many of these routes, the maximum ridership occurred multiple days. Like for example, the first route had <coughs> 29 riders four different times. Okay. So then the elementaries, their maximum ridership occurred in the morning on day seven, 235 students. Um, and it looks like I'm missing the maximum route ridership. So I will get you that number, but it's in that, it's slightly more than 235. So, as we were looking at this data um, and trying to figure out in a good faith effort, how could we make a later start time? It is low a cost to the district or cost neutral if possible or cost savings ideally. Um, we began to think about a standalone option. This wasn't in the hub system, but you know, we figured to, to do this process justice, we had to think if something occurred to us, we should bring that forward to you also. Um, we began thinking, well, based on these ridership numbers we're getting, maybe we could put the high school on its own tier. Um, there are co some considerations for that. If you look at, um, look at the ridership numbers we got, even in the perfect storm scenario, three regular routes would be sufficient for the high school. Um, the hub plan requires more special transportation because they don't have the excess capacity. The a standalone, um, standalone kind of takes that pressure off of this special ed transportation. Um, it would allow us to use um, the district's own buses, because we also did consider how those fit in to probably cover all the special ed transportation. So it had that benefit. Um, and it also has the benefit of not causing all the rest of the times throughout the district to have to change. Um, a downside, which, um, which is important to consider in the standalone option, but I think it's also equally present in the hub option, is that the routes would be longer. So a, start, a later start time at the high school 
doesn't necessarily translate into an equally later wake up time for the student. You know? um, so you may be starting the high school 30 minutes later, but some kids might only get up five to 10 minutes later to board the bus because the routes would have to be longer. Now that would mainly be for the kids at the beginning of the ride because that whole, um, you know, that whole lengthened ride time is distributed equally along the ride. For the kids who are closer to the school, they would get closer to the full half an hour benefit. But some kids would not be getting up to get on the bus that much later because of the additional route length. Mr. Moore has a question. Yeah, I, I, I'm not sure that's really true because um, right now, because of the way our tiers work, um, they arrive about, the buses arrive at the high school about half an hour early. And if you were to go to either the standalone or the hub, they'd be arriving, you know, the 10 or 15 minutes early. That's true. Which, yeah. so, I, so I'm thinking, I think probably for the 30 minute later start time, you probably get really close to the 30 minute laters on the bus because even though the route would be longer by the 10 or 15 off, minutes, right. you get, you arrive closer to school by 10 or 15 minutes. So I think you actually get your half hour. That's a good point. So, um, we projected out the costs um, because the purpose of this was to inform budget deliberations. Um, looking at our bus contracts and the contractual increase for next year, this is what the status quo um, looks like. It's $872,836. Uh, the hub plan, as you'll see, reduces the number of buses on three tiers. So you only have four buses on three tiers. We looked at whether you could reduce that further, um, but the, the problem you come up against in that is the hubs, because they're starting from four elementary schools in the morning. Um, you, can, you can't have three buses running from four hubs. Um, so that's kind of the minimum number you can have on three tiers. Uh, we think we did consider whether you could get um, fewer kids than the six, which were recommended by the Versatrans report on the other tiers, which would be the uh, elementary and the middle school tiers. And we, we found that, that you just couldn't do it because of what happens in the afternoon. In the afternoon, remember, the, um, or actually it happens, in, it happens in both places, in the morning and the afternoon. After those buses drop off at the high school, the four who are coming from the hubs then are available to do short routes to get over to JFK. But most of the time in between the start time at the high school in, in the original hub proposal and the start time at JFK would be um, consumed by travel time between the two schools because of time it takes getting out of the high school parking lot and time it takes getting into the JFK parking lot and time going in between schools. We had a bus do the route, you know, just to see okay, if we did this, how much time would be left to pick up kids? Now, we did also consider one other thing which um, wasn't part of the plan to try to reduce the number of buses at middle school, um, which was to add another hub. Because there are some good things about hubs. And once you start thinking about hubs, you can start imagining other hubs. One of the things you could do to uh, make those four buses at the high school more efficient is you could add a hub for JFK at the high school and say um, it would mainly be kids living on Elm Street and that area who are eligible for transportation to JFK, saying instead of getting picked up at their normal bus stops, they'd all have to walk to the high school, and then they could board buses from the original hubs at the high school and then ride to JFK. Um, and so you could get a bunch of kids that way, but not enough to really fill up those four buses efficiently. So that's why we came to the same conclusion that you would still need the six other buses to get kids who couldn't uh, walk to the high school for a high school hub, a new hub, or um, be picked up along the way. It, it, we timed it out at about, um, at about 14 minutes getting from school to school between travel and in and out, which means that the buses have about three and a half minutes they can drive away from JFK to pick up kids. So that doesn't really leave much, much pickup potential for them. They could also get the kids in between the high school and JFK who are eligible because there is some time in their, in their 
window to do that. But many of the kids who live between the high school and JFK are already not eligible for transportation because they live so close to JFK. So that, that becomes sort of the limiter there. And we um, you have to add the additional bands for special education. So the cost of the hub um, came out to be about 986659 um, That was a, that was a, a change, I think, didn't get reflected on this next slide. I'll, I'll, I'll go back to that. So a standalone option. Um, on this, you have three buses on one tier. Those are the high school buses. You have nine buses left for the other two tiers and nine vans for special education. Cost there is $963,711. Um, so when you put them all together, yeah, I think Oh, that, that, that's, that changed to get picked up. Okay, so comparing to the status quo, this is the big answer you know, everyone is waiting for. If you did a hub plan, it would be about $114,000 more. If you did a standalone plan, it would be about $91,000 more. Um, we have worked on this exhaustively. We've tried all kinds of different iterations of this, including throwing in more potential cost saving measures than were included in the original plan, but we really just can't get the numbers down below this. Um, I know that you've heard other numbers that were much higher. I, I hope you accept this as a real good faith effort to make the number as low as it can be, but I, I, I have to confess there's no way I can see to do it that's cost neutral or that saves money for the district. So, yes? yes. I, I agree. I don't th think I see. I, I did one question that I think would lower the hub a little bit, but it would still wouldn't make it neutral. Um, when you were talking about the amount of time for the f buses that went from the elementary schools to JFK, for those, I mean, to the high school, for them then to run routes, what, what amount of time? Because if we're making a schedule, we can set that amount of time. How much did you figure out? Sort of how much time it would take to actually use those buses? You know to use those buses to fill them up? And uh, when, when would that put JFK's start time? I, I didn't uh, do that because I didn't think that you'd want me to go beyond the changes to the start time that were originally in the Versatrans report. Um, but I could say, um, really, you'd want to be able to get one of those buses, I think, down Elm Street and the surrounding neighborhoods. You'd want to get one of the buses down towards the Bridge Street area in those neighborhoods. I would think that at a minimum, you'd think 15 minutes to go down and 15 minutes to get back to the high school, plus. Back to JFK. No, just to get back to the high school and then to go to JFK after that. So I think you'd have to move it, the, the JFK start time back another half an hour from where we were where that Versatrans report was, okay. was doing it. Well, the reason I'm asking is because I, I think I was the one who proposed those times that Versatrans used. Sure. Um, and um, I based it on um, basically it was 8 o'clock for the high school, and then I think I had JFK at 8.45. I, I believe it was 8.30. Oh, no. I didn't give them just half an hour to do that. So. Because the real point was, I think I was proposing something later than that because I knew that you have to get at least to go from the high school to anywhere out would take 10 minutes at least, and then another just the regular route, which is half an hour, and so that's why I think I allowed 45 minutes for that. Well, and 8:45, I'll point out, is still a few minutes earlier than the elementary start right now. So. Yep. Yep. Um, I'm not sure where. I'm not sure where in the report I read it, but I, I was going with the 830 figure, I believe, based on information from that. Obviously, if you move back the JFK start time even later, then you can use those buses more efficiently. But, but it would only be, again, it would just be one bus less, I think. At, at the at, most. At most. At the most. Right. right. And so that's about 50000 under our current contract? It's about 60000 60? So... If you were able to do that, in other words, if JFK were to be a later, that it would drop this number to what is that then? Seventy thousand instead right. of one hundred thirteen thousand. Right. Anyway. So um, this is the analysis I basically just described. Um, 
you know, the, the hub locks up those four buses, at least if the high school start time and the JFK start time are reasonably close to each other. Uh, taking out um, those four buses because they can't really pick up many kids, at least under the, the system I'm talking about, leaves the, rest, the remaining buses at JFK at 54, which is one under their capacity. Um, and that would also mean the JFK routes are going to be longer too, because instead of doing nine routes to JFK, you're doing essentially five routes for most of the kids to JFK. So they would also be impacted by earlier times to get on the bus for a later start time later on in the day. So anyways, our ultimate conclusion was that we agreed with the number of uh, large buses that would be um, required agreed with the Tyler report just based on ridership. Um, I, you know, I know one of the questions was, would we ever get to a, what would we do if we ever got to a point where um, we had a pass holder and there wasn't space on the bus for him? I think you know, that is an issue that we don't necessarily have to ever get to. We could say whatever number of buses we're going to use is the number of passes we're going to sell. And if there are more people who want passes, then we have spaces available on buses we could do a lottery. Um, so you can limit that problem. But I think even with that system, you can't, I don't see getting rid of an extra bus. So, you know, I, I see it, I really see it as essentially $90,000 or $100,000 to do a later hard start time at the high school, um, depending on the plan to go with. Now, um, I also I feel. About sure. That, about you, you saying about like one extra kid and then we need an extra bus. Um, I know that only a number of kids are supposed to be on it. However, what's supposed to be what happens, I wanted a field trip to JFK one time, and they decided to drug test the bus driver right at the top star of the. So off he went, we had four buses, but we asked for five. The staff had a good right there. I mean, so they didn't call off. The um, they didn't call off the field trip, and if one riot, I mean, if we do it based on the most average and keeping the high average, and that does happen every once in a while, I don't see how that's any worse than everybody going over on four buses, which has happened more than once. You see three kids in the seat. Well, I guess the difference I would see between what I'm talking about and the scenario you're talking about is you had some kind of an emergency, and that you had well, you had a field trip planned, and a bus driver disappeared. It wasn't right. actually an emergency. It was just the way that the administration planned it. I mean, it wasn't right. an emergency. Okay, an, un an unforeseen event. Exactly. This would be something we were foreseeing. I don't think we can build a plan based on we think there's not going to be enough room on buses, so we just want kids to double up or tri well, triple well, up. Well, I think that they should, we should do it based on that there should be enough room for right. most kids, but not to, to go way over and say, well, what if one right, day right. 500 kids decide to take the bus? Right. And I'm saying we can control for that. If we, if we say, Here's the number of buses we're buying. This is the number of spots we have. We'll only sell as many spot passes as spots we have available. Um, then, then I think you'll never be in that situation. Okay, and then another thing is this, if we use the standalone model um, at the high school level, there's a lot of kids that are in sports and everything else. Yeah. If we did that standalone model, would it be any way we could be able to make it go later so that could actually maybe incorporate a late bus and encourage other students to just stay and study or socialize or whatever and have everybody, you know, not have to run right now and feedback that I get is in order to catch a bus. Some kids, they don't have time to talk to a teacher or anything. After right, school. right. So the answer to that is yes. The One of the things about the standalone model is that those buses aren't committed to anything else except the high school. So you could drop off and pick up whenever you want. Um, I would recommend, based on prior recommendations that came from the high school, um, in mainly around sports, that if we, if we do this, we start with an 8 o'clock start time. As I said, those buses aren't committed, so you could adjust it later um, if, you, if you felt it was wise. But one of the concerns with um, later start is what it does to student athletes. So with a half an hour, um, I think recommendation from high school staff was that they would still be able to get um, the after school help they need if they have a practice and they would still be missing reasonable amounts of classes when they go to you know away games 
um, the ad hoc committee that I was on of, of start time, um, that was what we did. We had people from the high school also, and we specifically looked at what should be no later than. Mm -hmm. And no later than was actually 8.35, which brought it back down to 8.25 or 8.30, but no, I mean, even 8.15, they said, but not, the ad hoc committee didn't come with no later than 8 o'clock. And that's where we came from. Sure. Um, I'm, I'm basing what I said on recommendations that I've gotten from the high school, which I thought were considered by the ad hoc committee, but it may be they that that's a committee that I'm not aware of or not aware of how the outcome of that went. Right, because they were considered, um, and there was a lot of research into it, and a lot of different teachers asked, and um, I can't remember who was on it, there were quite a few people that were on it that had direct ties to going through, and their job was to ask the sure. department and ask the um, sports department. Mm -hmm. That's where we mostly get back to the athlete. Because he said no later. I have another question. Can I just, my biggest concern is that you've done such a good job of counting ridership and all that. I, my concern is that if we change the start time, we change the whole picture of the ridership of the buses. Because sure. I know a lot of parents may be driving their kids and dropping them off before they go to work. And with a later start time, suddenly you'd have those kids taking the bus or the kids whose parents are dropping them off because they keep missing the bus because it's too early. So my only concern is is if the numbers were to change dramatically based on moving the, the start time, is one option more flexible than the other or do we find ourselves suddenly in a difficult position or is that covered by what you're saying about only selling enough passes? I think... I just don't know yeah, how we deal with like a big change in numbers if we... If, if it changes, then start. My, my answer to that from a fiscal management perspective would be the cleanest option would be to say we're limiting the number of passes we're selling. Then if people say, oh, with a later start time, I want to ride the bus, and we run out of passes, we say, sorry, you know, okay. we can look at it again in the next year's budget. Okay. But, you know, to add, in, in either of those scenarios, that could happen. Right. But to add an additional bus to either of those would increase cost beyond what I imagine we would have planned for in the budget in the first place. Okay. Mr. Meyer. Um, so I guess looking at the ad hoc committee's report, they recommended 810 as their, as their final number. Um, so that's why I was, when I was looking at the 8 o'clock, which you have sort of coming out, start time should not be later than 8 o'clock, I was contrasting that with the ad hoc committee coming down at 810. Um, and it would seem like if you're going to if you're going to change it, get the maximum benefit that at least you know a committee that spent a lot of time looking at it said was possible. Um, I, I'm I'm not sure when you say that you would only sell the number of passes that you have bus capacity for. It seems like that defeats the purpose of the study. That what we were saying is, or I guess what I was conceiving of in asking for ridership numbers was. You want to have capacity for actual people who are taking the bus, and I, Howard can correct me or anyone. I think there's 240. That's the number I recall. 240 approximately high school passes. So what we see is, even if we take maximum route ridership and we add 10 percent, add 20 percent, add 30 percent. We're still more, not there. Is your point? I mean, add 40 percent. We're still, you know, below that number um, of passes. And, and I guess the, you know, the idea was that we wouldn't, I mean, we have hundreds of students who could show up tomorrow and, and say, we want to go to Northampton Public Schools. And we would, by law, have to accommodate them. But we don't build JFK to hold an extra 50% of students. So I guess I, I would think if we go forward with this, that we would be actually looking at, you know, the way we have here, look at root ridership and say, we really have 140 and maybe, you know, you use, I mean, first you use a conservative methodology to get maximum ridership and maybe you want to add a margin for error. But, so those are the two, two observations I have. I'm not sure I, I, I thought I was following you then. I think I, you lost me. So, so. Well, no, I'm just saying that maximum ridership is, I, like, I didn't understand when you said limiting the passes. Would you limit the passes to 142? No. I would limit the passes to, if we say we're doing three buses, right. the number of kids I could fit on three buses. Which would be 150. Right. 
which is still well lower than what we currently have. Yeah, I mean that's <laughs> so you know it 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 makes you wonder why people buy passes and then don't ride the bus. Well, I guess the issue is we have we also have an issue of crossover where we issue a lot of passes to students who have the right to the pass but may never use it. But then we actually have may we have a ridership of students who you know may need to ride the bus but they don't have the right to transportation free transportation mm -hmm. so I would wonder if we if we limit it whether we create a problem with students who have a right to the pass that population takes up most of that quota and uh -huh. then we are putting a significant number of the population that really needs to purchase the pass can't get it so mm -hmm. yeah I mean I'm a family um, who is we purchase a pass but we don't use it every day so I wonder I mean these numbers obviously aren't the same kids right there could be you know of the 125 riders there could be 200 kids mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. so it could be that we need those passes mm -hmm. Mr. Moore yeah I would I would think that if we um, you know basically look at the current ratios of just as a rough measure of utilization of the passes which we have out without you know, it would be cool to find out why it is that we have so many more passes out than what get used. But, but we know we we have a we now have thanks to you. I really appreciate that. We actually know how many of these passes get used, pretty much on a regular and also sort of a peak mm -hmm. thing. Um, and I would, so I would think if you were going to limit your passes, you would limit it based on that ratio. So for you know, in other words, if if for example, it's you know we have a whatever, I can't do the math right offhand, but say we have, roughly speaking, a two-thirds utilization of high school passes, that, then that's the, where we, if you were going to cap pass sales, you would cap it at, you know, 50% over your, whatever you were building for ridership. And I think you're really okay with that because I, personally, I, I you know, I want to point out this even different from Blue's example of, of a crowded bus. It's the, the, the time when you're going to exceed the 50 four seats or 53 seats or whatever is on a bus is on the last couple of stops. And then it's only going to be, you know, so it's going to be a half a dozen kids who are going to have to sit through to a seat. And for elementary school kids, that's actually those ratings on the side of the bus. That's why they say 78 or whatever they say. Um, it's because that's what they're planning on is three to a seat. And, um, and, the, and the same with JFK, you know, those are sixth graders instead of fifth graders. So you're talking about a half a dozen kids riding three to a seat until the first stop. So for, for five or ten minutes. So it's not really as extreme as, oh, it's full, you're going to have to ride on the roof rack. Or, <laughs> you know, it's more like, it's full, so you'll have to sit three to a seat for five or ten minutes. So you're saying there's a difference between what we're saying fits on a bus and the legal limit? For a there's bus? no legal limit. Oh, um, there isn't. Well, no. Can you there say is. maximum? Well, it's whatever, they, it's whatever the now, main the registry effect. can stop. Okay. Um, it, the, the three in a seat, well, I think yeah. we have 72 passengers, is three in a yeah, seat. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. It, and that typically is based on elementary, but there are rules within the registry that you have to have room for each student to sit on the bus. So I when you get to sitting. high school, you can't fit them. And the registry pulls over high school bus, and there's kids who can't fit into the right. seat, That'd seated. The registry can cite the bus driver and the right. bus company for violating And they can't, be, and they can't be like this on the seat. So you kind of take, basically, to get your high school limit, you take your 70, how I do it quickly, is I take the 72, divide it by 3, and multiply it by, out by 2, and you get about 54 kids on a bus. Yeah. If you're putting two in a seat. So you typically you say elementary. You can probably do 72. High school, you really can't do more than 54. And then middle school, yeah. yeah. You know, some of them can fit three, some can't. So and, somewhere and that's what I'm saying. If, if we base our... Basically, if you said we're saying 54 is our capacity, so we're planning conservatively, again, then all the scenarios where it, it, I think, again, if we've planned conservatively in terms of what our ridership is going to be, you know, we've gone with our maximum route, yeah. the biggest number on every route, um, and then we, and, and we and base our routes off of that. Uh, when you looked at, like, for example, the JFK routes, which I think are the biggest routes right now, right? Like some of those are 40 on their biggest day, 40, something like that. That still gives you another dozen empty seats for high school kids. And so if you budgeted that way, right, and then the day when you had a few more, again, it's just going to be a few more. Hopefully, they'll cooperate and be skinny kids sit together, three to a seat. <laughs> and, and it'll only be until the first stop. I mean, it's not as, it's not as draconian as 
you know, it's not like it's a flight to Paris or something. You know, <laughs> this, is, this is a school bus going from <coughs> JFK to its first stop, which is in Leeds or in Florence. Well, one thing I might suggest that could be helpful is we could, we could do the budget part of this process first because we have to know how much money we're True. budgeting for buses and how many we're going to purchase. And then at a later date, we could make a determination on how many passes we're going to sell. I'll tell you, personally, it makes me feel uncomfortable to sell more passes than we have capacity for and sort of gamble based on our past performance that not everyone's going to want to use them at the same time. Um, I, I personally feel more comfortable saying, I know I've got enough seats for everybody. Um, but that can be a discussion that we can have for sure. Um, the other recommendation that I would have is whatever, whatever model we use, the, whatever money is necessary to implement it over and above where we line up on the bottom line for the budget this year needs to come out of the high school because it doesn't make any sense to take funds away from other schools, including level three schools that are struggling and have been limited in many ways that I've pointed out in the entry finding in order to do an intervention for the high school, which I've also pointed out kind of in the entry finding in a lot of ways is the um, least struggling. Um, so, but then I think that's gonna bring us right into the face of this dilemma. Do we cut classroom teachers or do we cut programs that overrides have been specifically passed in order to restore? So I guess, you know, with all of that said, I'm looking for some direction on what you'd like us to do for the budget. Um, do you want, the scenarios I can think of are building a budget based on status quo, building a budget that includes um, cuts at the high school needed to implement standalone option if we can't fit it within our sort of 2.75% budget cap. Um, if we do uh, need to do those cuts, do you want to identify any programs as being sort of held harmless from cuts? Or do you want us to exceed the 2.75 cap if um, it comes to that and see if the city council will be um, amenable to increasing the budget beyond that point? Or some other alternatives, which could be, you know, provide us multiple scenarios and let us make the, de the decision at the time of the final budget. Or it could be maybe something you heard from the entry plan, you know, I'd really like to bring back one of those programs that cut, that got cut at the elementary level. Or it could be, you know, tell us, tell us what you think um, would be the best use of our money in this budget. So I guess I just need to know, now that you have the data, where would you like us to go with this as we get ready to present our first pass at the budget in the next couple of weeks? So would you be looking to build a level service budget uh, when, when you go to work? Because I, um, you know, as, as we look to maybe uh, allocate close to $100,000 for transportation, um, and we see it as something that could be beneficial to the, a, a group of high school students, uh, do you feel or think that based on your entry plan and your findings that there are areas that if when you're building the budget you have some of that money um, that you would use to absorb the uh, transportation cost may be better spent or you could bring a, a recommendation to the committee that we could consider uh, because th this certainly is um, money spent to help a group of students get some more sleep so that they can achieve better in school because they would be more alert and awake. Um, however, there might be other student groups within our district that may benefit equally from funds being diverted their way. And I would like to at least be able to consider that as well. So what I could do in response to that is start with a level service budget. Um, and then see if there's any funding left over, what are some possible uses of that funding? Um, and then I could bring those forward to the committee. I'd, I'd like to, um, I'm just concerned that 
they came out, the CDC came out and stated that this was a public health concern, one of our biggest public health concerns. And I don't think that we should minimize it. And I don't think it's just a matter of getting more sleep. Um, because as I said before, I went to Northampton High School when school started at 8 o'clock. My bus got here at 7 o'clock. There would have been no way I could have started thinking at 7 o'clock. But I actually pulled around and rested for an hour. And I was right to go at 8. So I think that there's just, I mean, a lot to be considered. And I, and I, I think we should work on their, the public health crisis of it and worry about the circadian rhythm of that will help everybody. I don't want to cut anything either. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, Pam. Um, so, you know, some of, some of the thoughts I have is you talked about in your um, entry findings the, the, um, the gap between our high-need students and non-high-need students, which I don't think was, you know, any surprise to anyone here. Um, you know, falling in the high-need students groups are low-income students who are going to be more likely to ride the bus. Um, and so, you know, they're going to be, I see them benefiting from a later start time. Um, and so this could be an investment in supporting a group that we know needs additional support. It just looks different. You know, it just looks different than, um, you know, a program or something that's really flashy you know, that kind of, you know, no one's going to be like, wow, we, you know, added a bus and that's really exciting, right? But it could have a big impact. And it's also going to have an impact on all the students because, you know, hopefully all the students are going to make it to high school and they're going to be, you know, they're going to benefit from this, um, you know, at some point. Just some thoughts that I'm having. Um. I guess I contrast this uh, potential outlay of $90,000, which seems, you know, always, it's always a bridge too far, whether it's $180,000 or $90,000 or even if it's $50,000. But at the same time, when we looked at the numbers for compliance with education, for um, physical education, they, those were far larger numbers. I mean, those really knocked me back um, because it, it, there is a limited pie of money, and when we take from uh, when we add to one area, we take from the other. But at the same time, I really, I'm, I can't get around the fact that the American Academy of Pediatrics has now issued, you know, their findings that this is this is pretty well settled um, in terms of sleep deprivation being a health problem. I mean, it's wider than an educational problem. And, and just looking at two districts, two large districts with a lot of resources to study the problem, but at the same time, with many reasons to resist making start time changes, Montgomery County and Maryland and Fairfax County and Virginia, which went back and forth and back and forth, and, and finally um, have now moved forward. So I don't think any, you know, the interim superintendent who preceded you talked about it as a resource issue, but I don't think there's any school district, public school district in the United States that has resources to throw at a problem that doesn't need to be solved. Um, so. I guess my inclination would be to build the budget with the $90,000 and, and prioritize it as something that if, you know, as the mayor is, is building his city budget um, as something that it's very important to us. It will improve, I think, the experience for all students. Um, but I think what Ms. Hanna said about um, there is research indicating that the students who are even more likely to benefit might be some of the students you, you identify as not being served currently by the system. So I, I, I don't want to say this is $90,000 that's, that's taken away from other possible uses, um, as I pointed out, but I, I think it's valuable. Well spent. I agree with 100%. I think, you know, I know the research and I teach at high school, so. My concern is what Blue said at the end, I don't want anything cut. And so I, I get very concerned about that um, because I, I see this as a trade-off. And I want to prioritize it. And then I will tell you, is this my fiscal part of my mind is saying, well, are you going to come back and we're going to cut arts and then lose more kids to charter schools? And then we have another budget issue. If we have $1.89 million going to charter schools, will we get another hit? or will you cut foreign language in the sixth and seventh grade? 
Um, so I see it as a trade-off. I totally support it and I want to invest in it. I agree completely. And yet, I know when this committee voted for it, there was no cost. And that to me is a really easy vote, and I'm sorry for the people who are on this committee saying that, but now it's a trade-off. So I want it, I really want it. Um, so I would love to see your budget, and I, I, and I, would, I don't know what I would cut other than, I don't know what. Well, when we first started, <coughs> when we first voted on it, the American Academy of Pediatrics had to come out with their language uh, and other uh, things. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm just saying, you know, when we did it, yes, it was kind of easy to do it when. However, is it something that we prioritize? All students are going to benefit. And I really do um, also want to agree with the other block. The other block. You know, we, we may actually be really solving another problem. So maybe let me just reflect back what I'm hearing because there may be a process here. There's obviously a diversity of opinions. What about if we start with level service budget, see where that brings us, then develop whatever kind of a cut list is needed at, of high school programs in order to implement high school uh, later start time, and also bring a list of other programs that would be recommended um, to be implemented in the, in the next budget to help with other priorities that were identified by the administrative team. And then you'll have sort of the base budget, and then you'll have other options to choose from. Does that make sense? It does. I have a, a couple of questions. I, I think, um, well, an observation first. I, I think the, the, the only research I've seen on the topic showed uh, the, the benefits to essentially the kids on the, the bottom end of the achievement gap. Um, had roughly twice the benefit from a later start as the kids on the top of end of the achievement gap. Um, and that sort of, you know, makes sense when you think about what are, the, what are the issues that you have if you're on the bottom half of the achievement gap. And then another thing that's been pointed out is that a later start frequently improves attendance, which whether Again, which <laughs> chicken and egg, I don't know, but, but it improves attendance. And whether it's because education is more meaningful when you're awake or whether it's because it's later so it's easier to get there, I don't know which it is. So it improves, basically it does a lot of things for people on the bottom end of the achievement gap because I think the attendance gap is also greater, higher, you know, absenteeism for people who are doing worse in school. And, um, so, which makes me ask the question, do you know, we get Title I funds, do, would that be a, that's for low-income students, and is, is that sufficient, in other words, the fact that a later start benefits low-income students disproportionately, does that, would that justify using Title I funds to fund it? Uh, no, because at the high school, there are insufficient numbers of low-income students to become what's known as a, a school-wide program. In a school-wide program, you can use your Title I funds for anyone under the um, sort of presumption that the, the poverty level is reached to such an extent that it affects everyone, whether you're poor or not. Okay. Um, at the high school, which is, would be a targeted assistance program if it even qualified, right now it doesn't qualify for any Title I funds because it's too, um, it has too few low-income students. Um, what would have to happen is, because it's targeted assistance, you could only per use Title I funds for transportation for Title I kids. So then you'd have a Title I bus. And yeah, yeah, yeah. No, 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 no I'm not bus. suggesting yeah. that. Yeah. Yes. No, I wasn't suggesting that. I was asking if, I was wondering, because I noticed, I saw one of, remembering one of those graphs where it's sort of like the, the high needs line was going up yeah. <laughs> over time. And I was wondering if it had gone high enough up for that to be a. Not at the high school yet. Not at the high school. Um. So this is going to be my first budget season, and I don't really understand how this all comes together. Mr. Meyer just mentioned the phys ad hoc physical implementation committee type. At what point are we going to know if that's something that we need to act on immediately? Um, and it, yeah, well, I'm well, saying if they say that needs to be implemented by September, sure. Um, so when um, then do you redo all these numbers again? This may be. Uh, this may be a time to give the whole committee an update on the PE group. So as, as you know, um, 
and as you know, we're right now proposing to implement it over the course of four years, which would mean there'd be no impact to next year's budget. If we get a um, finding that says you have to implement it all next year, um, that won't come until next year, which would mean that um, the budget would already be passed and then we'd be trying to figure out what to do. The good news is that um, you always have a year from the time of the finding to reach full implementation, at least, which means that then our plan would be okay to go to full implementation the following year, and we'd have time to build it into the budget. But, but by building it into the budget, we would be making more cuts potentially? Depending on where our level service budget ends up. It's kind of the same place we are right now with um, this discussion, the sort of big cliffhanger out there is we don't know where level service is quite yet. You know, it may be that you have to do cuts even to get to level service, or it may be level service is quite low and we can do all these things that we'd like to do. Okay. You know, probably Thank you. More closer to the first and the second. And my issue, we're putting on my mayor hat here, is I still have some large numbers that are outstanding before I, so we're trying to build a budget based on you know, the fiscal stability model where we've used, you know, certain percentage increases, but we've still got some numbers. Health care being the biggest one. Health insurance is really the big question mark. I mean, that's a $10 million line item in the city budget. And so we're waiting to see what rates that the GIC approves at the beginning of next month. Um, and that's, you know, a one percentage change is a hundred is there's your that's a hundred thousand dollars a one percentage change in our health insurance is a hundred thousand dollars so 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 i'm so we're trying <laughs> and of course we don't have a we don't even have a governor's budget yet that hasn't been submitted although that will be submitted in a, in a couple weeks so at least we'll have that to look at so um so we asked the superintendent to build essentially a level service budget and using this 2.75 as a guide for that, 2.75% increase to the school appropriation. Um, so we'll see how, and uh, I've been checking with him on a hourly, daily basis on how that's coming. But when does it all <laughs> really come it, together? When do you get by all law, these it numbers? Comes in April. <laughs> well, I have to submit it. I have to submit a total, th this body has to, has to pass a budget by April 15th and then um, I have to submit a total city budget by May 15th. And when um, do you expect to get GIC numbers? March, early March. We'll have them by early March, so that's good. I mean, we'll have them before you have to take your final votes. Okay. Um, you know, imagine Amherst, they have to pass their budget by, I mean, they have to submit it by January 15th. They, <laughs> they, so it's sort of like they're flying completely blind. Um, so it's, it's harder. So, uh, yeah, but even now we're still curious to, about what's going to happen with the state budget. So it's not very, it's not uncommon for there to be many uh, iterations of a budget over the next several weeks as numbers come in and things change and as things get prioritized. And so, um, you know, be, being an elder member here, on the committee you know, for seven years now I, we've gone through some very some very tough budget times and it's really taken a lot of thought and consideration of the uh, the committee to, to direct the superintendent in his or her budget uh, creation around programming um, with the override and, and the mayor's great oversight of of the management of the override funds we have, that burden of really deep cuts in many iterations to a budget, uh, as evidenced last year, uh, was almost nothing. So if, if you were watching at home last year because you weren't here, um, and those that were, you, um, you, ne you never felt the, um, the pinch and the pain of a, a, a hard budget like maybe Howard might remember or Downey might remember. I think it's terror ed is the word I would terror. Remember. There you go. Um, and so I, I think in times like the fun these, uh, when, the, when the years are good and, and you live through the bad, um, like I have, I'm always cautious to kind of get too much into things knowing that um, there could be a downturn or an unexpected cost 
a few years ago we had to take all our circuit breaker money, all our chapter set, all, uh, all our funds that we had, school choice, and we, we just zeroed out the account. And then we just crossed our fingers that there was, there was no sped cost that was an override, that the furnace didn't break. You know, we were, we were going to pray to the mayor and the city council for funds to, to, to bail us out. But I don't think we, you're praying to me we, that we, year. <laughs> that was a different mayor. We were, we were in a situation where um, we were really going to have to make some uh, tough cuts to the school department that we didn't want to do if we didn't spend every cent that we had. And so as I look now, and I know we have a little bit of money in reserve, um, I'm concerned down the road in the next couple of years because we have um, increased the salary. Uh, the superintendent identified that uh, many of our teachers are still on step increases, so that goes above the COLA increase. And so the number is going to shrink really quick. And whether I'm here on the committee or not, in a few years, I have this kind of apprehension that we, we might be in for some tougher times. But as the mayor has done with his plan throughout the city to manage money, I think we too, as a committee, may have a responsibility to, to manage in a little bit our own way to look forward to see if we can keep those cuts away from us from another year too. Howard. I think, yeah, I totally remember the, when I was first on the committee, I think that was the year it was a choice between eliminating scores of teaching positions or what we did do, which was not funding the raise that was contractually obliged. So, I mean, that's a ridiculous set of <laughs> options. It was really, really tough. Um, and so with that, I don't know what we should do here. I, I, I just think that remembering how important the, the schedule is, both in terms of it being a schedule, so something that people rely on, people build their lives around. Also, the start times being really very important in terms of their impact actually on our students and their learning and their health. Um, keeping in mind um, that transportation is roughly a million dollars of our budget um, and going to be ever growing. Um, th this, this whole topic, uh, you know, we get criticized for spending a lot of time on it. I think it's a really important topic, both in terms of the number of dollars, just root dollars that are spent on it, and um, in fact, just this process of discussing transportation over the last three or four years has resulted in savings because we discovered we were running, I think, the full tier of buses to the high school when we really only needed to have the five. Um, so we can see as a result of that, but it was only because we had this discussion on going over what are we doing with our transportation and what are we doing with our schedule. You know, things come up, people are concerned about the impact of a later start at the high school on after school help for students at the high school. And then you realize that any student who rides the bus from the high school has zero opportunity ever to have after school help. And as we know from these numbers, that's roughly 100 kids which is an eighth or a ninth of the kids who simply <laughs> cannot do after school help because of our schedule, you know, the combined class schedule and transportation schedule. And so that's why, you know, these are important questions. I don't know what the answer is going to be because it does then have one more thing, which is just the revenue stream. And, and it is, you know, if you spend for one thing, you aren't spending for another. So there's, it's, it's tough. But I think it's really important to keep all of these options on the table. When I look at, um, you know, one of the features of, for the me of the hub program is, is exactly one of its drawbacks, which is that it changes all of the school start times. Mm -hmm. One of the features is it gets all of the teenagers starting later, including at JFK, which is, again, as I think Downey pointed out a couple of years ago, middle school students actually need more sleep, okay, than than high school kids. And so, so it would be actually really beneficial for them to be later also, which is one of the advantages of the hub system. It's also one of its drawbacks because it's a schedule change for more people. And so, you know, it goes like that. It's an important issue because it does matter. Um, and it matters in lots of ways. And it's clearly something which, at this point, our schedule, our trans all our whole system has really just been a series of accommodations over the last 30 years related to essentially decreased resources. 
And so the challenge is for us, and I think not just in terms of this issue, the transportation slash schedule <coughs> issue, but in everything is how to continue to be, you know, sort of trying to be aggressive and innovative and thoughtful in the face of continued financial pressures that really makes it very easy to just be sort of, okay, we'll just draw a line through this. <coughs> um, so how to keep the sort of enthusiasm and optimism about looking for ways in which we can actually improve the education we offer um, at the same time as we figure out how to do it with less money. Is it, one last thing. Um, I'm going to reiterate something that Howard just said that the late bus, the standalone I like in that it allows for that late bus because I'm in a school where we have a late bus and kids really take advantage of it and it's an incredible program for kids who are really struggling to get that extra support. <coughs> so that standalone plan, it offers that option, which is, I think, a great benefit. Mm -hmm. So just to try to wrap it up, do you feel like you've gotten um, <coughs> the guidance that you need in terms of taking what you've presented tonight and then um, presenting what the options would be in the context of the budget? Well, I'll reiterate it one more time what I think the direction was, and I'm <laughs> missing it. We start with level service budget, see where we are in terms of overage or underage to the 2.75, and then um, if, if we have insufficient funds to implement a late start at the high school, develop a cut list for the high school, and also provide a list of other programs that we think would be worthy of funding so that the committee has a full range of options in front of it when it makes its final budget vote. Does that, uh, I see heads nodding. Yeah, I, I have one really question. So I know that there was, um, you were having conversations about how to actually change the start time for students by allowing them to vary their program rather than changing the start time for the entire <coughs> That's that is is something that we've discussed a little bit in the PE committee. I, I can't say that it's borne fruit yet. It may have borne some flowers. But. Yes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, yes, Ms. Oh, I just want to say um, just to thank Dr. Provost for bringing us this information um, yeah. at the start of budget season. I mean, it's been something that has been uh, around for. I don't know. Maybe Mr. Harrell could tell me, but a long time. And so it's really just good. In, I mean, these are hard decisions that we have to make. Um, you know, the public has given us the responsibility <coughs> of making these tough decisions um, and looking at, you know, what's going to be best for the students, you know, in, in terms of their health and well-being, their academic achievement, um, all of that. So um, it's really helpful to have this information before we start the budget as opposed to after it's already well, I'd also like to say that um, this has been an ongoing issue, and I really like the clarity of your re report and that it answered questions, quote, finally, that needed to be just presented out there so that we could see it. So um, thank you very much for making it comprehensive enough to be able to read and actually make sense. And obviously we should also thank Joy Winnie because she helped oh, these, uh, these yes. counts and, and all your people and behind the scenes who had to do all the count the manual accounts every day at our request so yeah. thanks to all of them as well so okay um, so uh, I do not believe we have any new business um, only other thing would be to just remind people of future business and meeting dates we have a budget and property subcommittee meeting on February 19th at 4 p.m. in the superintendent's office we have the superintendent evaluation team meeting on February 25th at 4 p.m. in the superintendent's office we have our next regular school committee meeting uh, reminder we have two this month uh, February 26 2015 at 715 here at JFK the negotiating subcommittee will be meeting on March 5th at 4 p.m. in the superintendent's office and then the budget and property subcommittee will be meeting again on March 5th, 2015 at 5 p.m. in the superintendent's office. I will now entertain we'll a motion. to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. All those opposed? Any abstainers? Abstain. The meeting is adjourned. Abstain.